Assalamu alaikum to all. Please announce yourself and where you're calling from. Assalamu alaikum. This is Nevada Shabazz, and I'm calling in from New Orleans. Ramadan Mubarak. Assalamu alaikum. Waluddin Sabir, calling from Atlanta, Georgia. Very good. Please continue. Assalamu alaikum. Hassan Abdullah, New Orleans, Louisiana. Ramadan Mubarak to everybody. Good to hear you. Please keep it coming. Ramadan Mubarak. Jesse Raleigh, North Carolina. Good to see you, Jesse. Keep it coming. Assalamu alaikum. Sophia from Bermuda. From Bermuda. Cross the way. Cross the waters. Keep it coming. William Safir in the house at Atlanta G8. Indeed, indeed. Let's keep it coming. Name, where are you calling from, please? Diane Walker from Cleveland. Yes, ma'am. Always good to see you. Good to be seen. All right, let's keep those names coming. We got a lot for you tonight. Jafika Abdullah from Atlanta, Georgia. In the house. Peace. Wonderful. All right, keep it coming, please. Your name and where you're calling from. Yahya Hussain, Atlanta, Georgia. Try it again, Yahya. You got blurred up. Yahya Hussain, Atlanta, Georgia. All right. Bashir Muhammad from Panorama City, California. Excellent. All right. Breton Suri <laughs> from Australia. Oh, indeed. Our friend. Appreciate <laughs> you being back with us. Alaikum salam to both of you. Thank you for being with us. Let's keep it coming. It's Jennifer <laughs> Hall from Cleveland. Jennifer, oh, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm very well. We have one of our first families in the house today, huh? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you and Diane. Yeah, that's great. All right. Let's keep it coming. Kareem Hassan from Cleveland. Oh, Cleveland is thick up in the house tonight. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. All right. Khalil Sultan, Atlanta, Georgia. I was waiting on you. Good to see you, man. Yes, ma'am. All right. Sheree Umrani Muhammad, New Jersey. Oh, <laughs> my friend, one of our first learners from way back in the day. <laughs> Glad to have you in the house, Sherry. I miss you. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. All right. Let's keep it coming. Abdullah, Abdullah Akbar. Okay, Abdullah, try it again. You got blotted out. Abdullah Akbar, Lenore City, Tennessee. Okay. That's interesting that two Abdullahs tried to chime in at the same time. All right. You already know Abdullah from Brooklyn. Okay, there we go. Right on. All right, we just about got everybody. Come on, I, I didn't hear from Ezekiel. I didn't hear from uh, Naima. I haven't heard from a few of you. If you're there, chime in. This is roll call. Naima Brooklyn. There she goes. All right. You know I couldn't start without you. Mr. Hardy, time war was. Sorry to hear about what happened. Hadia is Hadia in the house. Come on. Now. Oh, uh, the marshal tells me. Ma'am, I'm going to take you up there from Atlanta, Georgia. There we go. All right. Keep it coming. Unless you know of some reason why I would do it. Thank Keep it coming. Well, You've already announced yourself. That. Please mute your phone so that we can have a nice, clear call. Thank you. All right. I think we may have one or two people left for introductions before I begin. Okay. Well, let me put my face in the place. Okay, I believe you all can see me. Yes, sir. See you well. As, as we uh, begin our logistic, our logistic and linguistic journey into language, and that would be the premier language brought to us through the Quran, the word of Allah, our source creator. We begin as always with Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. I'm going to ask William Safir if he would open us up with Al Fatiha. A'udhu billahi minash rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin arrahmanir rahim maliki yawmiddin iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'in ihdinas siratal mustaqim siratal ladina an'amta alayhim ghayril maghdubi alayhim waladdallin Alhamdulillah. We thank Allah for all of us being here this evening. 
I didn't mean to spring this uh, meeting on you at the last minute as I did, but I do that sometimes just to try you. <laughs> See who the loyal ones are. <laughs> this is wonderful. So thank you. And those who could not make it, I understand. People are at the masjid. Some people are preparing to break their days fast and to put other things in line. Some people are getting their 130th of the Quran read and they're taking their time with that, what they believe to be their Ramadan duties. And that's all well and good. That's fine. We're going to be speaking to a lot of that phenomena before this uh, evening's meeting, meeting has, uh, has completed itself. So let me find my notes and we're going to jump right into this. And as you know, if you've received my email, if you've received my email, you know that today's uh, topic is the purpose of Ramadan. The purpose of Ramadan. Now, that might sound regular in most of your ears, like, okay, the purpose of Ramadan. I mean, we know what the purpose of Ramadan is, instructor. The purpose of Ramadan is to fast during the daylight hours and break it at sunset, Maghreb time, and make all of our daily ritual prayers and read the Quran, you know, one juice a day, one thirtieth a day, and hold ourselves up in our masjid and make tarawih and make, uh, you know, all of the other supererogatory um, ritual prayers and kind of, kind of, uh, kind of cordial us, ourselves off from the rest of the public, including our family members who are not Muslim. We're not supposed to even deal with them so much, you know, we're supposed to, you know, try our best to deal strictly with Muslims during Ramadan. And uh, your instructor is here to tell you that that is hogwash. And I use the word hog on purpose. <laughs> most of what I just said that most people think the purpose of Ramadan is, is not true. According to Al-Quran, according to the Quran itself, it's not true that you're supposed to hold yourself up in your local masjid. Huh? Yeah, you're supposed to fast all day. And then when it comes time to break the fast at sunset, then you go to your local masjid and most people unfortunately begin to gorge themselves with whatever available food there is until their tummies become so full that when they stand on the line for tarawi and whatever other salat they're there to make, they're halfway falling asleep while they're doing it because they're just too full. That's not what Ramadan is. That's not the purpose of Ramadan. See, they think the purpose of Ramadan is to make sure that they spend as much time with Muslims proper as they possibly can, even to the exclusion of people who are not technically considering themselves to be Muslims. And that's not true either. According to the Quran, we'll go through what I'm talking about so that you're absolutely crystal clear on the message that's coming not from me. It's not my interpretation of what the Quran is saying. I'm going to show you the exact words in terms of what Allah is saying. Most people are fasting beginning at sunrise and ending at sunset, which is normally called Maghrib time when the sun just begins to go down and people can't wait until that sun just begins to go down. And as the sun begins to go down, they rush to break their fasts water. They think if they're not breaking their fast with dates, they're doing something un-Islamic. You know, if, if you bite an apple, you think something's wrong with that. No, no. If you, if you bite a, a, a bologna sandwich, there's something wrong with that. But what if it's not, uh, you know, haram? What if it's not uh, pork? Instructor, if I bite into a halal beef sandwich <laughs> at Maghrib time, when it's time to break the fast, I'm doing something wrong. Yep, 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 you are. You should be breaking that fast with some fitrah food. Not, not that hit in the head stuff. I don't care if you call it halal. I don't care what you call it. If it wasn't treated right and you thought saying Bismillah, Allahu Akbar over it after, before you slaughter it, but it wasn't raised correctly on the farm, then it's not really halal. So for you to break your fast with that is to break your fast with something that's been injected with chemicals and so forth and treated wrongly, probably as it was growing up, kept in a pen and, you know, wasn't allowed to exercise as an animal should. Yeah, I don't care if they call it halal, balal, kalal, doesn't matter. 
it's not fit for breaking your fast with. So that's correct. So find something in the fitra. My goodness. Yeah, the prunes are good. <laughs> the dates are good. All of those things are good because Allah created them. Find an apple, find a grape, doesn't matter. Doesn't have to be Middle Eastern food or food that you'll find in the Mediterranean. And in fact, most Muslims don't know it, but even most of the dates that you're breaking your fast with come out of Israel, not out of Muslim lands. If you didn't know that, I'm sorry to be the one to break. No, I'm not. I'm supposed to break these things to you. So go to the stores, go to your Muslim markets. If you have those close to you or have them imported, if you don't find a Muslim market, that's a part of Ramadan, supporting yourself, supporting Muslim ambitions. And I'll explain to you what I mean by Muslim. So you're not twisted on that either. When I say Muslim, I mean, anybody who is willing to engage in peace and keep the peace. That could be your Christian grandmama. When you go to see her and she says, how you doing, boy? Salam salaikum. You know how our relatives do. And she's willing to keep the peace. She does everything to accommodate us. She said, I cook ham hocks today, boy, but I put your plate aside and I didn't you no pork grease for your dinner, boy. Come on and enjoy yourself at this dinner. Come on, sit here next to your grandma. See, that's a peacekeeper. <laughs> and technically speaking, believe it or not, that's a Muslim. Now, mu'min is a different story. That's another advancement upon those who have accepted al-Islam as a way of life and are choosing to inculcate that way of life in every aspect of their life. They are seeking to make sure that the guidance of the Quran is the primary guidance. So that's a mu'min. That's one who has committed to establish themselves upon the faith that the Quran teaches in the way that the Quran teaches. But those who just agree to even disagree without being disagreeable, those people are still within the circle of what were called Muslims during the time of Muhammad to Prophet. Now, if you haven't read enough about that era, then you're not clear more than likely in terms of what I'm referring to or what I'm talking about, but you need to investigate history more than just a few spurious hadiths that you've been sold on because they don't tell you the whole story. They don't tell you the whole truth, nothing but the truth on the most part. They give you the opinions of people who pull that information together and presented it to the Muslim public as though it was the Quran itself. And that's just not true. I'm not here to start trouble tonight. I'm trying my best to be nice. Let's get this linguistic party started. Did you know that you could party during Ramadan as long as you're partying over the words of Allah? You are celebrating the words and the wisdom and the guidance of Allah. That's the kind of party that you can engage in 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Let's continue. So we're here on this Friday, March 24th, 2023. And for the rest of this month, you're going to hear echoed every time you meet a Muslim, you're going to hear these words echoed, Ramadan Mubarak. Now, I'm here to tell you once again that that phrase is not to be found in the Quran. It doesn't mean it's bad. It doesn't mean you shouldn't say it. The instructor's not trying to tell you something to pit you against another Muslim who is saying it and all of Just like I told you that Assalamu alaikum is not in the Quran, <laughs> but salam alaikum or salamun alaikum is in the Quran. So I encourage people to say salam alaikum and leave the definite article off because as soon as you put the definite article on salam, it becomes as salam, which is one of Allah's attributes. And Allah never, ever, ever in the Quran uses any of his attributes to put that power and that authority upon us as human beings. So if you say assalamu alaikum, you're saying the weight, the power of what assalam means is upon you, the people, and you couldn't hold that kind of weight. I know I can't. That's like saying ar-Rahman alaikum. What's the difference? They're both attributes. We can't do it. It doesn't make sense, does it? So why does it make sense to attach a definite article to salam, making it one of Allah's attributes? The attribute assalam is in the Quran, but never as assalam alaikum upon you. It's not in there. Only salam alaikum is in the Quran. So I want you to keep these things in mind. 
And there actually is one instance where as is being wished upon someone, but it's in a very unique and unusual set of circumstances related to the birth of Isa, the one that we now call Jesus. He said, as wa ali. <laughs> I'm going to let you research that one. Who did Jesus wish the peace upon? And we'll get into that conversation on another day because it'll take us into a whole new field of uh, endeavor. So Ramadan Mubarak, let me tell you what Mubarak means. And then you choose whether you want to continue using it or not. I still use it. I just don't say that it's from the Quran. But I still use it because Mubarak has a great meaning. Let's look at it. This M-U here on Mubarak means one who. It's referring to a human in this case that you're talking to. You're speaking to a human. And uh, the real word here is Barak or Baraka. Barak or Baraka. Barak or Baraka. And what is Baraka? Most people would translate that to mean blessing. The word blessing. So let's, let's, let's see if there are any consonantal connections there and oh lo and behold they are you have the b in blessing in english and you have the bait or the ba in arabic in barak you have the l in the english word blessing and l interchanges with the r in barak and you have the s and s interchanges with the k in consonantal connections you see it in the English word circle where both of those are c's in english but one is pronounced like an s Sir, and the next one is pronounced like a K, Col, Sir, Col, or Sir, Cus. So the K and the S are given in that word or in those words as the letter C, you see. Because in linguistics, you can also interchange sounds that occur in opposite sides of the mouth or parts of the mouth. So the S sound is in the front as a sibilant a friction in the front of the mouth to say s, 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 and the K is from the back of the throat. So they're at opposite ends of the mouth, but because they're opposites, they're still considered to be related. So I hope that was understandable. So we say Ramadan Mubarak. Now, what do they tell us this means? They tell us that it means blessed Ramadan. See, blessed Ramadan. And we know blessings normally represent uh, a gift of some sort. If someone blessed you with something new or something that you were looking forward to or a gift of sorts or whatever, then we consider that to be a blessing. Now, what exactly does that mean? A blessing as a baraka simply means that somebody brought something from where they were over to where you are. And before they brought it to you, you didn't have it. You were empty of it. You were devoid of it. So they took it from their stash, from their bank account or from whatever, and they brought it over to you. They emptied themselves of it and they filled up your space with it. That's the literal meaning for maraka. It's a blessing as a gift, but the gift means that it came from here to fill up an empty space over there. So if I give somebody something that they really didn't need, I didn't give them a baraka. I just gave them some more stuff to put in their garage <laughs> or in the closet. So before you give a baraka, you should look to see what it is the people need. See, you should be inquiring. See, I see your child or your children have been coming to the masjid every week, and I notice that their, their sneakers seem to be a little bit too small for their feet, or they seem to be a little too dingy. Their shoelaces are coming apart. And uh, would you mind if I take them to the shoe store after Juma and purchase them some new shoes or some new sneakers? See, they needed that. So they were empty of it, and you went and brought what you had over to where they are now you don't have that piece of money that you gave up but you filled their life with that joy 
That's Baraka. So is Ramadan supposed to do that for you? Absolutely, positively, yes. But just make sure that that's your focus. And I'm going to show you, based on what's in the Quran, what you are supposed to be filling their lives with and whose lives you're supposed to be filling that with. Oh, man, I, I couldn't wait for tonight. I, I couldn't wait. I, I didn't want to save it until Monday and Tuesday and all of that. This was necessary for today. And I thank all of you who have showed up in these numbers for being with us. Now, let's say something about nunetics for those who might still not quite understand what we mean when we use the word nunetics. Nunetics is from an Arabic letter called nun, which is the Arabic letter N, the letter N as in Nancy. Nun is how you say that in Arabic, and it has several meanings. The primary meaning for the letter nun is seed. Seed, like the kind that you plant into the ground, into the soil. So what this is saying is that every Arabic letter is actually a seed letter. That means that within the letter itself is a hidden expression that if put into the right environment will begin to produce all of the things that Allah placed within it to produce. You don't, you can't see it when you look at the seed, but if you put the seed in the proper environment for growth, that's when the seed is going to eventually open up and express itself as what Allah intended for it to be. So we call it nunetics because we use this linguistic, this linguistic science to open up further meanings for words in the Quran, being that each letter is a seed letter. You put those letters together. Now you don't just have letters. You have actual words and statements and sentences, actually, just from one root word. Just a three-letter combination is actually giving you a sentence and not just a word as we've been taught when we've been taught Arabic. Continue to listen. Nunetics is a linguistic technology. My wife invented that phrase for nunetics. It's a linguistic technology which allows us to compare consonants pronounced in the mouth, compare them with related consonants from the same part of the mouth. I'll give you examples in a moment. The human mouth itself can only pronounce seven basic sounds from seven respective parts of the mouth, which are enumerated below. So these are the seven parts of the mouth from which all sounds from all languages on planet Earth come from. Number one, we have the open-mouthed sounds that are called the vowels. And you have to open your mouth and keep your mouth open and not let any part of the mouth touch itself, so to speak, while pronouncing these sounds. They are A, E, I, O, and you, that's English, not Arabic, that's English, but it's the same for Arabic if you're talking about the fatha, the a ah sound, or kesra, the e eh sound, or dhamma, the o oh sound. Same thing. No part of the mouth is in touch with any other part of the mouth. It's all open mouthed as a vowel. So we have that a e i o u, and they say in English sometimes why, depending on where it is placed in the word. It's also a vowel, especially at the end of a word. Number two, we have what are called labials. Labials, also pronounced labials. They are the sounds of the letter B, F, P, V, and W in English. There's some variations of that in Arabic. Arabic does not have a letter P. Arabic does not have the letter V. So the F or the B would substitute for the P and the V in Arabic words if we're translating them out of the English language. But those are labials. They involve your lips. B, B, B. The two lips have to come together. F, your bottom uh, teeth have to touch the top lip to say F. P, your two lips have to come together and explode. P, P. V, of course, like the F, your bottom teeth have to touch your top lip to say V, 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 V. And W, you can hear the B sound in the middle of that letter, D, B, W. 
Then we have number three, gutturals. And gutturals are exactly what they say. They're emanating from the gutter or the back of the throat, gutturals. So they are the hard C as in cat, C-A-T. They are the uh, hard G as in girl, coming from the back of the throat, g, g. They are the H, which comes from the back of the throat as uh, uh, from the back of the throat. You have the J of J, which also comes from the back of the throat. The K, K sound, which comes from the back, X. See, you can hear the K sound in X because it's a guttural also. And we have the sound of Y, if it's at the beginning of a word as Y, Y is coming from the back. And you can also include the letter A as a guttural if it is the first letter in a word. And that's in Arabic or in English. Ah, Allah, that A at the beginning of Allah is a guttural also. The second sound of A, Allah, that ah right there, that's a vowel. So Allah contains a guttural called alif as well as the vowel fatha. Next, number four, we have what are called liquids. And liquids are only two letters of the alphabet in any alphabet. They are the L sound and the R sound. Why do, are they called a liquids? Because the sound is supposed to produce a kind of flow. So if I say L, L, you can hear the flow of the, of the, the, the note. L, you can say that for a very long time, right? L, same thing with R, if you let it roll like it's supposed to. So in Latino countries and in Arabic speaking countries, there are has a trill attached to it. So we wouldn't just say R like we do in English. We'd say R, Ar Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, that trill, because the tongue is touching the top palate, but it's it's reverberating. See, when you say L, the tongue is touching the same top palate, but it's not reverberating. It sticks there magnetically. So the L gives us magnetism and the R gives us electricity. Isn't that wonderful how Allah built that into language? Electromagnetism right there in the language, in the pronunciation. And you'll learn further down the line, for those of you who are new, if you stick with this, you're going to learn how so many different concepts, ideologies, philosophies are actually built into the sounds of these letters. We are being taught philosophy through language. Isn't that wonderful? Because the words that carry these sounds that I'm mentioning, such as L and R, when they are employed within the word itself, the word then takes on the significance of what that letter represents. So the words that carry that R at the beginning of their work, they are electric. In their connotations, they carry the meaning of electricity. Now, isn't that wonderful? If you taught your children and your children in school and your children at home and your grandchildren, if you started teaching them this nunetics linguistic technology, look at the research that they themselves are going to want to do when you tell them, go bring me back 20 words that begin with R and 20 words that begin with L. And let's test Instructor Bilal's theory. <laughs> Start with the word car and see if there's not an electric component con uh, 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 connected with it. In fact, they call them now electric cars. I never heard of them. I don't want a magnetic car. You go start it up and it won't go anywhere because it's stuck to the ground. <laughs> I want a moving vehicle. Huh? So this is true. Also for words that Allah is employing in the Quran, they have very heavily inundated conceptual frameworks, philosophical frameworks. Number five, we have nasals. They are the M and the N, Michael and Nancy, the M and the end, because if you hold those sounds, you're going to feel it reverberating in the nasal cavities, in the, in the nostrils especially, but in the nasal passages. M, you're going to feel that reverberation right there. The same thing 
with N. You're going to feel it right there. And again, if you stick with this class, you're going to learn also that M and N, although they are consonantally connected, one is uh, feminine and the other is masculine. The M is feminine. That's why you have it in words like mother, mommy, um. And the N is masculine. The N means seed. And the seed that they're talking about is the seed that the man produces called sperm. It's a wonderful technology. Number six, we have dentals, pardon me. And dentals obviously are sounds in the mouth as consonants that are made using the teeth, the dentals. D, T, see, you need your tongue to press up against the two top front teeth to pronounce D and also to pronounce T, right? there in the back of the two top front teeth. T, D, see? And also the TH sound, the, the. If you were missing teeth in the front, that's how your T's would come out as the, the, okay? But those are dentals. The only difference between a D and a T is that in order to pronounce D, your tongue has to press off of those two top front teeth, the back of those teeth to say door. You feel a slight hesitation. If you do it right now to yourself, with yourself, you'll feel that hesitation if you pronounce the sound of D slowly. There's a slight hesitation, D, see? But T, no hesitation, immediate. And it's because of what those two letters mean. D means slight hesitation. Resistance, in other words. So think about some of the words that you've learned in English that begin with the letter D. Let's start with the door. Hmm? If you open a door or if you close a door, there's going to be a slight resistance in the door. You need to put some force into closing a door depending on how heavy the door is. Hmm? Uh, think about the word down. If you fall down by mistake, your body is going to try to do everything imaginable to stop you from hitting the ground. It's going to be resistance because you are falling down. To think about death, <laughs> how resistant are people to even plan? Most people won't even plan their funerals ahead of time, knowing they're going to die. <laughs> they won't plan. So let's sit down and write out a will. Do we have to do that right now? That reminds me of dying. Well, guess what? One day, that's where you're going to be, in the ground, six feet under, as they say, dead. But there's a resistance, a natural resistance in the psyche, because the psyche is being is being signaled by that letter. D uh, hesitate, just hesitate a minute <laughs> until you can get grasp of what's being said or done here. D, see? And I'm sure you have your own two or three other D words that you can throw into that mix to corroborate what it is we're saying. But T is an easy touching or intermingling or intercrossing of the tongue and the teeth because T represents crossing. Like, the, like at the sidewalk where there's an intersection, that's what T is. T is just a simple intersection of one direction going uh, uh, across another direction. So it represents two directions. So the letter T represents two. That's why you have it in the words T-O. See, I will be going to the store. That's me going to the store. That's two things, me and the store. And uh, if you want to come to, feel free. See, if you want to come T-O-O, -O, feel free. That's me and you. And when both of us go to the store, there will be T-W-O of us going to the store. You got it? There will be two of us going to the store. So it's the T, that letter that is making all three of those words represent two things and two things only. If I touch something, it's just my hand touching the surface of that thing. Nothing else is involved, just two. I'm telling you, this is the science that is going to make automatic and probably even overnight geniuses out of our children. If you don't believe it, go to our website, go, go, go to our YouTube channel and look at the children that we're teaching now. 
Hmm? You look at the children that we're teaching and you'll understand that this language is a gift to us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's more for our children than it is for ourselves. In fact, if I were you, every time I tune in to Instructor Bilal's uh, classroom, I'd have me at least a teenager next to me. Yeah, that's just me. I'd have at least a teenager, maybe a preteen listening, as long as they could stand it, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. But to ask them to take notes, to pay attention. Number six, we have the dentals. We spoke on that. And the last ones are number seven, the fricatives. They are the soft C sound, as in circus, the S sound, as in the word soft, the Z sound, as in zoo, and the SH sound, as in shine. All of those create a particular level of friction. See, a fricative creates friction in that front part of the mouth. So you've got your elementary school introduction to pneumatics. If you were not aware of it, we're going to refer back to this chart to explain some of the things that we're going to be discussing concerning Ramadan. So this inspired pneumatics method allows us to then identify words and their underlying themes. Now, pneumatics is not designed to interpret the Quran. So let's, let's get that straight. This is not an effort that is designed to interpret the Quran like Yusuf Ali and the Muhammad Assad and the rest of the translators. That's not what this is designed to do. It's not designed to translate the Quran. What it is designed to do is probably even more important than a translation of the Quran because it's designed to isolate out the individual letters and open up those letters and the possibilities that Allah has clocked into those letters in the same way that he has clocked possibilities into each and every seed. You can't see it just looking at it, just like you can't see what the word is saying just by looking at the letters. You have to open those letters up. Now, how do we know to trust what it is you're saying, instructor, about what these letters mean? Because I'm not giving you the meanings for these letters, the fitra meaning Mother Nature, if you will, is giving us the meanings. Now, you might say, well, you said that Aleph is the spine. And how do, we, how do we know you're not making this stuff up? Because when it comes to Quranic Arabia or Quranic Arabic, every single one of these letters is given to you in the Quran itself. In the Quran. I'll give you just a couple of examples. Allah says in the surah called Quraysh, Quraish, etc. How do they uh, interpret that or translate that? They say for the protection of the Quraysh and also for the covenant of Quraysh. Quraysh is an ancient tribe during the time of Muhammad, 1500 years ago or so. They were the, the main go to tribe of the day. He himself, his family was from the tribe of Quraysh. So what is it saying? Ilafi. Ilafi means a covenant or a bonding and a binding that gives strength to that thing. See, when you bind together, you, 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 you become stronger. So ilaf is from the same root as the word alif, the letter that we're discussing now. And alif means strong. It means leadership. The Quraysh were the leading tribe of their day and time. So Aleph is being expressed through Ilaf in this instance in the Quran to represent that same strength. But it's a strength that is due to them binding together. Hmm? Now, in the Quran, Allah speaks to the prophet called Moses or Musa. And... Uh, He asked him the question, what is that in your right hand, O Musa? What is that in your right hand? Now, there are several words in Arabic for hand. In fact, in the alphabet itself, there are two words. 
that represent the hand. The first one is called a calf, K-A-F, calf, and it represents the palm of the hand that is able to capture things. You see that word capture? Most of the words, even in the English language, that have that ka sound, that K sound, have to do with capturing thing in its center. So if I say, I caught it or catch this ball, center of the hand, palm of the hand. If I say, sit on the couch, center of the couch, hopefully, if there's nobody else sitting there. If I say, come with me, I need to drive my car to the car wash. Well, the car captures you when you get in it, right? No matter what seat you sit in, the car is going to capture you and the seat belt is going to uh, maintain you. If I'm a member of a club, the club contains me and my activities, right? Different from other activities, the club is going to maintain me and contain me until the club meeting is over. Same thing with the classroom. It's a containment, container. See, that cast sound always means to contain like the palm of your hand contains things. So that's one letter that represents the hand. The second letter is all of the way at the end of the alphabet and it's called a ya, ya. And it gives us the word for hand in Arabic called a yad, Y-A-D, yad. So we have to be aware of these meanings the words that correspond with these particular letters that we're employing. The Arabic word yad is probably the way, uh, or I should say the Arabic word yad is probably, or was probably, let me get this straight, pardon me. I meant to say the Hebrew word. There's a Hebrew letter called Yad, Y-O-D. There we go, Yad, that I believe is the way the Arabic letter Ya used to be pronounced and it got truncated. I believe it used to be Yad, just like the hand. The Hebrew is Yad and the Arabic, I believe, was Yad. And I have very important reasons for believing that, but we don't need to get into that tonight. Suffice it to say that yed means the hands as they stretch out to receive. You've seen people out in the sunlight, in the morning light, doing their exercises, their yoga meditations or whatever, and they're just greeting the new day, greeting the morning sun, right? Yeah. And when people are pleading for something that they need, they also have that particular posture. Oh, Allah. And in fact, we say what? Yeah, Allah. You see the yed at work in yeah? Yeah, Allah. The letter's right there looking at you because you're employing Allah, not that you can give Allah something. It works in reverse also because you're stretching your hands and your arms out to say, I'd like to receive something from you, Allah. So yeah, it goes both ways. And it means that in the language, to give as well as to receive. I'm trying to go slow enough so that you get this. Now, so we're talking now about a linguistic technology, a language technology that is able to derive meanings for Quranic words above and beyond what your average Arabic English dictionary can provide for you. Now, we spoke about the word Ramadan itself in the last uh, couple of classes that we had. And I'm going to add to those meanings by explaining an additional meaning for the word Ram. Ram, the word itself, wherever you find it being used in any language on this planet, it means exalted, held high, exalted. And this animal called a ram uses his horns until he is the last ram standing on top of the mountain. Not on the side of the mountain necessarily. After that ram battles with other rams to be the top ram and leader over the sheep, that ram stands on top 
as the single leader over that flock. So RAM always means exalted. You have something called RAM in your computer. I want you to think about that. You think that's an accident? Now, why have I capitalized the R and the N? Because as you saw in the consonantal connections chart, the letters M and N are interchangeable as nasal sounds. So whoever you see RM as an RM in RAM, you can also make that connection with R when it's connected with N as it is in the word horn. It's going to give you the same connection. And where's that connection? In the fact that the ram uses his horns as his defense, as his main protection against all competition. And those horns are what allows that ram to rise to the top. If you notice even the shape of a horn, it's shaped to point towards the upper portion of something, the horns. Look at the horns on any animal. They're always shaped like that. The bull, right? The bull will come at you, get you with his horns and throw you into the air if you're the matador. Hmm? Because the horns themselves represent that kind of upward movement. Even when you're blowing a horn, most horns are made so that they go down and up like a saxophone huh? or a trumpet. You know, then when you blow the trumpet, you don't blow down like uh, Dizzy Gillespie. I don't think it's Dizzy that does that. I think it's, uh, I forget the other jazz player's name. You know what I mean? The weird one, I forget his name. But he likes to play looking down. You know. But most people, when they play their horns, they're playing up. That sound is going up into the atmosphere. See? Because the nature- Louis of, Armstrong? No, not Louis Armstrong. Uh, the one that was married to Cicely Tyson at one time. You know who Miles, Miles Davis. Davis. Miles yeah. Davis, my man, yeah. <laughs> a genius, but my goodness, right? Yeah, he used to like playing down to the ground, you know, that kind of thing. But most horn players, as you horn players and other musicians know, like to play up, mm -hmm. play up. Sometimes uh, somebody like Little Richard will be sitting down playing piano and the spirit will move him to just get up off of the uh, off of the seat, off of the bench, right? And he starts standing up and playing. Stevie Wonder will do the same thing. He can't stay still when he's playing that keyboard, right? He's got to jump up and start standing. And sometimes they'll get up and start standing on top of the piano. Isn't that some stuff? Because music does that to you. Music is intended to exalt you also. Let's continue. So this thing called rum, people get high. That's what they call it, getting high off of rum, another RM word. Now, the consonants that are forming the word Ramadan are the Ra, Meme, and Dod, as we discussed in the last class. Let's just uh, repeat very quickly for those who missed it, what these three syllables and what these three letters in the word Ramadan actually stand for. Ra is the word that many ancient civilizations had to describe the sun, the S-U-N. In ancient Egypt, they call it Amun-Ra, the sun. That's where you get the word ray, as in ray of sun. The meme is used to denote the moon, the moon. The letter meme itself in Arabic means water. It means turbulent water. You can see the turbulence in the letter itself going up and down, up and down. Those are waves in the water. So it's not standing still water. It's not water that has reached its equilibrium. It's water that is still looking for equilibrium. So it's rushing up against the shore. It's pushing up against the rocks and all of that. That's mean. And what is causing that on earth? The moon. The moon is pulling on the tides. When the moon is full, you're going to witness on earth many oceans and seas and rivers that all of a sudden develop high tides. That's what they call it, high tide. Don't go sailing your boat out there at that time because there's too much attraction hmm, coming from the moon and beaming down on the waters on earth and causing a magnetic pull. See, a magnetic pull. So the waters become disturbed. And we'll talk further about what that symbolizes in the human being, him and herself in a moment. And then we have the letter Dod, not the Dal, not, the, not that D, Dod. And Dod means the earth, but the earth in the process of decay or destruction. 
So keep that in mind. You have that letter in the word for earth in Arabic. It's called Ardu. That D is a dot. And it's telling you something about the nature of the earth itself in the scheme that Allah planted that word within, within the Quran. When you hear Allah speaking about al ard look at the surrounding words. In fact, one of the first times that word is introduced is when Allah is speaking to Adam and his partner. Allah never calls her Eve, so you should stop calling her Eve, Muslims. Allah never says Adam wa Hawa, Adam and Eve, like the Bible does. Never. So why are Muslims around here talking about Adam wa Hawa? Adam and his wife Hawa. It never says that her name was Hawa. <laughs> So you should stop saying it. If it's not in the Quran and Allah has not said it and Allah has not emphasized that that is her name. You know how many names Muslims use that they think are in the Quran or part of the deen and they have nothing to do with it. They are simply uh, scholars in Muslim history who have lifted those names off of the pages of previous scriptures and suddenly implanted it into the Quranic framework of language. Al-Khidr is a good example. There's no person named El Khidr in the Quran. Oh no, that's the man who was tutoring Musa. No, it just says there was a man who spoke to Musa and said certain things. The Quran never says he was called El Khidr, not to mention the green one. Where'd they get all of this? I just told you. They got it from scholars who were trying to prove how smart they were compared to how smart Allah is. You have to think in some part of your strange brain that you're smarter than Allah. If you are introducing things into the Quran that Allah did not say, what you're really saying <laughs> is that you know better than Allah or that Allah must have forgot to put this. So I have to make up for Allah's, you know, shortfall. I want you to think seriously about these things during this month of Ramadan, because that's a part of what Ramadan is for. You'll see that in just a moment. So Ramadan is speaking to the attributes of the sun, the attributes of the moon, and the attributes of the earth, but the earth as it is in the process of decay. Let's look at a good picture of that now. Now, on the left here is a picture of the earth parched, meaning the soil that has been depleted of its moisture. That's what it looks like. That's the earth in its decadent form not in its soil-rich form. This is the earth when the sun has been continuously bombarding the earth with no relief from the rain. It looks like that. Now look at the picture on the right. That's dry skin. And you can see that when you magnify that dry skin, it looks exactly like what parched earth looks like. And they say that the meaning for Ramadan is scorched earth. It's speaking about the intensity of the sun during that particular time of year when the sun is constantly and consistently beating down upon the earth. And the earth has no relief. All of this is factoring into the true meaning for Ramadan as Allah has designed Ramadan, not as, not as the scholars have designed Ramadan, as Allah has designed Ramadan. So dry earth or soil, dry soil resembles dry skin. And skin is symbolic of what? Our human sensitivities. Imam W.D. Muhammad was so magnificent in his explanations of the word bashar in describing human life. Basharun mithlukum. In the Quran, Muhammad the prophet was told by Allah to say that Ana basharun I am a mortal flesh and blood sensitive man, just like all the rest of you. I'm human like the rest of you. And my human self is very sensitive like skin. Basha also means the skin. It means the top portion, the top layer of your seven layers of skin. You have seven layers of skin. You have seven chakras. You have a lot of sevens running through you. Below you, there are seven uh, layers of earth. <laughs> and above you, there are seven skies. According to the Quran and according to science, there are seven major planets floating around up there. So these sevens are replete throughout the fitrah is the point. 
So your skin is where your initial sensitivity is to the point where if you just touch the top of a protruding hair coming out of your skin, you can feel it. If a fly lands on that hair or in the fur of the back of an animal, that animal will shake its back. Just a fly, a mosquito, because the skin is that sensitive, not the top part of the skin necessarily, but what's lurking beneath the surface of the skin. And people who want to rule us on the sensitivity level, they do the same thing. They don't necessarily go to the top most portion of your sensitivities because your mind is waiting to evaluate that thing that's being said to you or that thing that they're talking about doing to you. So they don't approach you from the top portion of your sensitivities because the top portion of your sensitivities is directly connected to your intellect the top portion of your thinking capability. So they go beneath the surface. The hair goes beneath the surface of the top skin. And that's where the sensitivity is. So if you touch the skin or you touch the hair, there's no pain involved in that. You can handle that. But if they stop pulling on your hair, that's going to cause tremendous pain, isn't it? Because the hair is sub-rooted. And Imam Muhammad said that the hair represents sub-rooted intelligence. Man, oh man, what a teacher. Oh man, I, I can't begin to explain to you if you don't know anything about Imam Wadafuddin Muhammad. I don't see how you can go to sleep tonight with at least, with without at least Googling his name and keeping him as a reference for you to review later in the week. Wisdom from the West that is neither East nor West. Is right down the middle. It's fitra. So the skin, I repeat, represents your human sensitivities. And when those sensitivities become devoid of moisture, the body can become very uncomfortable. Hmm? Water as a topical solution keeps our bodies physically clean. We all know that. Water is also a symbol of emotionality, your feelings, as well as moral thinking, both of which Allah has designed and installed into the human system in order to keep us internally clean. So topical physical water keeps the top portions of our body free of filth, free of grime. Hmm? But internally, water is represented by your emotions and you need to keep your emotional self clean also. You ever notice that after you get a good cry, that's water, right? After you get a good cry, you feel better. <laughs> you start, man, everything seems to be like, like you just took a shower, right? Refreshed. Oh, I had a good cry. I, I had that cry coming, people will tell you, right? Because water represents that refreshment. Yeah, that reset on your emotionality that is able to say, okay, I got that out of my system. I'm ready to do this now. I'm ready to start over again, right? Well, hug, hug, hug. You know, the old days, I think, had a song once called We Cry Together. Right? <laughs> I ain't gonna tell you what they did after that because it's Ramadan, but you get the message, right? Water, whether it's crying, whether it's sweating, you get a good uh, workout in, or you're on the basketball court after the game. Hey, man, you high-fiving people. You're exhausted to no end, but you feel so good. Like your muscles are aching, but it's like, oh, it's a good ache. Oh, man, I'm glad I was able to stretch and run and, you know, right? Because that sweat brought out of you a lot of the tensions and a lot of the things that you were emotionally holding in, probably. And those things were released as energies. This is the excellence of the human makeup as Allah created it. So on the inside, we're talking now about your emotions and also about your moral thinking because it's your moral decision-making that also keeps you clean on the inside. It keeps your personality clean. If there's some soot or some dirt or some unwanted blemish or something on your character, on your whatever, then it's up to you to begin to do those things, put those things in motion that are going to eventually erase that blot on your reputation, on your personality, on your behavior. Ramadan is designed so that you have all of the facility necessary given to you by Allah hmm, to be able to begin to get your eraser out and start getting rid of all of the things that are not a part of your fitra composition. 
It's time to erase those things from your personality, time to erase those things from your psychology, time to erase those things from your ideology, from your religion. Start erasing the stuff that's not a part of your religion, although they presented it to you as though it's a part of your religion. I'm giving you, I've given you a bunch of stuff already in the beginning of this class that is not a part of your dean, but were introduced into the dean for whatever reasons. I wasn't there. I can't calculate what they were thinking at the time, except for what they've done and continue to do. And what they're continuing to do is keep the average one of us off course as Muslims. They're keeping us off course. We've lost our balance when it comes to how we view ourselves as Muslims, and we lost our balance as to how we view the world through Muslim eyes. And I told you that a Muslim is anybody who has agreed to keep the peace. Stop thinking Muslim is some ethnic group. That's the other big lie that's been told. Muslims are the Arabs of Muslim. And they don't have to say it in words for you to feel that. You got a whole group of Muslims now over in Israel, so-called Israel, called Palestinians. And the oil-rich Arabs have not yet said we're going to send them economic assistance. They're Muslims? How come you don't help them? I thought Muslims were supposed to help Muslims. Well, we help Muslims if, you, if you're an Arab. <laughs> I'm not talking about all of them now. But obviously, too many of them think like that. If you have trillionaires in Saudi and the Palestinians are suffering like they're suffering, you should at least say, well, we're going to designate a certain numbers of billions of dollars to at least uh, if you can't get along, then you need to go along. You need to just go along and get out of there. Maybe we can uh, find some space in the United States. Maybe I'm riding down here in the South. I see plenty of land. <laughs> we can't bring all of you, but dang on it, we're going to make a point. Let's bring 5,000 Palestinians to America and situate them in different parts of the country. Huh? They do it with every other people who are having problems with oppression. They got you sending your tax dollars now to Ukraine, and you couldn't point out Ukraine on the map if you wanted to. You ain't know nothing about no Ukraine before they started sending billions of American tax dollars over there without your permission. So don't tell me nothing about, eh, no, we're not going to help no Palestinians. They let them help themselves. Well, I say the same thing for all the other people that they want to send our billions and trillions of dollars to without our permission. Yeah, that was a political plug. That's what I do from time to time. Now, we're talking about Ramadan and the control and disciplining of certain aspects of our human life, our human nature, our human fitrah. Now, the words soil and soul are consonantally connected and are therefore related. All words, I don't care what the language, that are consonantally connected, connected by certain consonants, they're going to have related meanings, not always the exact meaning. Most of the time, not the exact meaning, but just like you have related genetics with your sister and your brother siblings, you're not them, but because you have related DNA, you're going to resemble them in one way or another. And it's the same thing with words. They have letter DNA. And if those letters are related, they're going to have related meanings or related themes, as I mentioned earlier. Now, if the soul becomes depleted of its moisture, meaning its moral thinking and its proper sensitivity, then plant life will cease to grow if the soil, that should be soil, okay? If the, if, if the soil is depleted of moisture, then plant life will cease to grow. And if the internal life of humans becomes devoid of emotional sensitivity and moral thinking, true human life will also cease growing. So let's change this to soil as it should be. And when we talk about the internal life of the human being, there is where we're talking about the soul. Okay. You should be writing these things down if you can. Not everything I'm saying, but the main points so that you can remember them, go back over them and repeat them and share them with other people without having to guess at what was said. 
So here are some other examples of consonantal connections for you to compare. I'm going to go through this quite quickly, so pay attention. The word Quran and the letters that you see that are capitalized are the consonants in the word. So we're talking again about consonantal connections, and I'm proving the point that consonantally connected words are going to share themes, underlying, undergirding themes that make those words related conceptually. So the word Quran, it has the Q, the R, and the N as consonants. And it means the word of Allah. Then we have the Arabic word kalam. You talk about the kalima, right? Kalam. Kalam also means the word of Allah. When we talk about the camel, or pardon me, the kalam of Allah, we're talking also about the word of Allah. Not in the same way that the Quran is speaking about Allah's word, but in a related way. Then you have another word that has all three of the same consonants in it, but distributed differently. That's the word Malik. In al fatiha we say Maliki Yawmiddin, and we translate that as the owner or the king or the judge of the day of Deen. Malik means ruler, judge, king, but it's a reference to Allah also. The same one who revealed the Quran and the same one who is in charge of the word, the kalam, that he's distributing amongst human beings. So it has related consonants, therefore it's going to have related themes. Then we have a Hebrew word called a lemech. That's out of the Old Testament or the Torah of the Jews, of the Hebrews, a word lemech. And lemech means powerful, strong, and is also a reference to those who are sitting in positions of power and authority like kings and judges and rulers. So lemech is consonantally connected to the Arabic word malik. And you can see where the themes line up perfectly. Now I'm gonna give you the same consonantal connections, but in other words that you recognize in English, we have one called the camera, camera, like the camera that you use to take pictures. The camera that I'm looking into now, right? So that you'll be able to identify me in this webinar. And that's the CMR, but the C in camera obviously is pronounced like a K sound. So the C in camera is the same as the K in Malik and Kalem, the same as that K, the C sound. Then the M, you can see, stays the same Lamech, Malik, Kalem. The N and the M are interchangeable. So N in Quran is interchangeable with the M in Kalem. I hope you see how this is going, although I'm going quite fast so that we can get all of what we need to present to you in before the session is over. So you have the K, that should rightfully be a KMR. Here you have a K-L-M. So where's the R? It's interchanging with the L sound, as we said. L and R are always interchangeable. In Asian countries, you might have someone greet you with a hello, and another person come from Japan and not China, and they say hello. See? They're interchanging the L's and the R's because they're pronounced from the same part of the mouth, the top palate. So they can become interchangeable, just like you have uh, amongst the Pakistani people. Um, they say hadith. I want to read some hadith, and they give the Z or they give the uh, TH sound, the S sound or the Z sound. He's a hafiz. He's a hafiz. But it's hafiz, see, in the Arabic language, see, and it's zikr, zikr in the correct Arabic pronunciation, but the Pakistanis will say zikr. And they're not wrong because it's the same part of the mouth, which is given the same impression to the psyche. <laughs> they're interchangeable, psychically speaking, is what you need to understand. So going back to camera, a camera is that which is a reflection of the power related to light. You need light. And in, in order to produce the result of the camera's picture taking, there was a time when you had to be, go into a dark room with a red light. See? So it's all talking about a reflection of light. You needed a light, a flash bulb in order to take the picture back in the day. We don't need that anymore with our cameras. 
phones and cell phones and all of that. But back in the day, not that long ago, we used to need a flash bulb. We needed light to reflect off of the object and then bounce back into the camera. Hmm? So the camera became a reflection of power, but the power itself was in the light. The same thing with the Arabic word, Amr. You can hear it sounds almost exactly like camera. Amr, what is Amr? The moon. The moon and its reflection of light and its reflection of light is its power. The more the moon becomes lit during the month, it reaches that midway point where it becomes a full moon. That's when it has the strongest power on the tides that we were talking about earlier. It starts pulling the tides, creating those waves. It starts making people crazy, they say, right? <laughs> lunatic. That's where they get that word, lunatic, because of the lunar moon. When it's full, it's at its strongest in terms of the magnetism. So what is it pulling on to make people lunatic? It's pulling on your waters, see? And what are your waters in terms of your human self? Your emotions. See how it all fits together so neatly and nicely? It's pulling on your metaphorical war waters. It's pulling on your literal waters because a human being is about 70, 80% water in, in our body. About 70% water in an adult in your body based on your blood and all of that that's flowing through your body, the liquid. So it's pulling on that also and it's agitating you. You becoming all stressed out and depressed and you don't know why. It's because you don't know how to control the influences that are coming from these uh, stellar and lunar bodies. It's a science to human life that you have to recognize and master. And the Quran is here to give you insights into how to master the universe that we call you. Allah says he has created ayat, instructing signs in the skies. He has created ayat, instructing signs in the earth, al -ard. and in you, Allah says, there are similar signs. But most people go on paying it no mind whatsoever, according to the Quran. See? So there's science that is intended to help bring you into the correct understanding of how what's above and what's below has to do with what is internally above in you and internally below in you. But most people are not paying that any attention. So that's Kamar, a reflection of light. Look at Bakara. That's the name of the second surah that we're reading from today concerning Ramadan. And they say Bakara means a young cow that is called a heifer in English. Heifer. Look at the word heifer. Heifer, the H sound is a guttural that matches the guttural letter off or Q in Arabic. The F sound is a labial lip sound that matches the B sound in bakara, the letter bait. And the R in bakara and hefer stays the same. So even in the English language, the words bakara and hefer are consonantally connected and therefore they're going to be related in terms of their meanings. And I hate to be the one to tell you this, but a very important word that is used amongst the Roman Catholics is vicar. V-I-C-A-R, vicar. And that's referring to the Pope himself. He's the vicar of Rome. The V is a labial that interchanges with the F labial and interchanges with the B labial. The F is a guttural that interchanges with the C, which is a K sound, vicar, not sar, vicar. Interchanges with the H, that's a guttural, in heifer, and the Q, that's a guttural, in bakara, from the back of the throat. And then R stays the same. So the words bakara, young cow, or heifer, Interchanges with the letters in the English word heifer and also with the letters in the uh, Latin word that became an English word, vicar. Vicar. Now, how are all of these related? And there might be a hint here, I'm sorry to say, but Allah knows best. It might be a hint here that the Bakara that Al Fatiha, pardon me, the Bakara that Al Bakara is speaking about is the vicar of Rome. I don't know. But the more I study this, the more I'm convinced that Allah is speaking to that form of leadership in the world, not only with the Pope, but with any leadership body in the world that is 
positioning themselves as the de facto spokesperson for God, the one who speaks for God to the people, and the only one qualified to speak to God for the people. I know that's in the Catholic doctrine. I've read it. That there are religions that have positioned themselves as the de facto religion in the world. And no matter what they tell you in the public behind closed doors, they believe that your religion is totally illegitimate and ours is the only one that will be accepted by God. You already know that there are many Christians, unfortunately, who have been fed that lie. And they believe that if you have not accepted Jesus to Christ as your personal savior, you are not going to heaven. You're hell bound. Don't care how good you are, how much charity you've done. Nothing. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior, you are hell bound, according to most uh, denominations of Christianity. And they got that so-called logic from the first major body of Christians in the world. And those were the Eastern uh, Church first. Orthodox Church, they didn't teach that about Jesus. It's only when the Western Church became established as the Roman Catholic Church that they began to inculcate that doctrine through many instances in history when they began to build upon their particular logic and establish their particular logic in Rome during what are called a series of councils that they named Nicaea based on the city that they were established in. So the Council of Nicaea, look it up, 325 AD is when they began to say that Jesus was the son of God and the Lord of Lords and all of the rest of what the Catholic Church teaches. And I'm telling you that I believe personally, you do not have to believe the same, <laughs> but I believe that Allah is speaking to that in El Baqarah and telling those people you got to stop saying that. You got to stop saying that that particular person speaks for God. That person is human like you. And I bash out on the myth of the coon is what Muhammad was told to say. I'm a mortal like you. I'm not this guy who God speaks to and he can't speak to nobody but me. And whatever I say is the only thing that God says and whatever the Protestant or the Jewish guy or the Buddhist guy is thinking, that's all illegitimate. That's not what the Quran came here to tell you. So you got to slay that. And I believe the reason that it puts it in the mouth of Musa is because that problem began and became exacerbated amongst the Jewish population of planet Earth. They were actually the main ones to advocate the doctrine of uh, some people or persons speaking for God. So you might say, well, what does that have to do with Catholicism? That's not what the Catholic Catholics are not Jews. No, but they got that strategy from wayward Jews, not all Jews. Most Jews have no clue that that even happened in history. But the very fact that they have built into their doctrine that they are the chosen people of God, irrespective of their behavior, irrespective of uh, every other people who do good in the world. Who do, no, it doesn't matter. If you're not born through a Jewish womb, I've been told this by rabbis. If you're not born through a Jewish mother, I don't care who your father was, Sammy Davis Jr. If your mother was not Jewish. You are just an adopted Jew. That's what they told Sammy Davis Jr. when he converted to Judaism. I was born into Judaism, if you didn't know that. So I know exactly what I'm talking about. I get this from the mouth of rabbis and other people who purport to know the Torah in its language and its context. But other sources of information come along, as it did for the Jews. The Talmud was invented. The T-A-L-M-U-D. That's not the T-O-R-A-H. Or the Torah of the Quran. That's not what the Talmud is. The Talmud is a collection of rabbinical writings, meaning the writings of their rabbis, in the same way that the Hadith, on the most part, are really just the writings of imams and other scholars. And I believe the Muslims fell into that trap of building up the reputations of hadiths, of the words of men. They fell into that trap by studying the strategy of the Jews that came before them. And they had plenty of help in ancient Persia when the Arabs left Mecca and Medina 
and went into Persia for conquest, which they should never have done, but they did it. And when they did it, they beat the mess out of the Persians until the Persians who were practicing fire worship religion, Zoroastrianism, and the Persians gave in and said, y'all got this. What do y'all want us to do? We want you to become Muslims. Okay, we'll become Muslims, so said the Persians. But why don't you let our Persian religious leaders remain the religious leaders? Muslims said, okay, that'll make our job easier. We just tell you what to say. They said, bet. But they didn't know how uh, much of a strategist those ancient Persians were, especially as they were being advised by some pagan Arabs in disguise calling themselves Muslims. In the Quran, they call munafik, hypocrites, pretending to be Muslims, pretending to be peacemakers. You see them right in the beginning of Al-Baqarah. They say, we are the peacemakers. What are you talking about? <laughs> when Allah pointed them out, ah, you're not the peacemakers. Huh? Yeah, it's all in the Quran, what I'm telling you. So when they conspired with each other, that would be the Zoroastrians who wanted to keep their own religion and maintain their own religion and culture. When they went into cahoots with the hypocrites from among the sincere Arab Muslims, the sincere ones, they said, well, we'll just ride this thing out. Let us stay the leaders. And as leaders, we're going to begin to write down on paper what you Arab Muslims are telling us is religion. And that's when the pagan Arab hypocrites among the Muslims began to say, okay, write this down. And that's where the majority of those 700,000 hadiths got their birth, the fabricated hadith. And the scholars amongst Muslims say that out of the 700,000 hadiths that appeared over a period of time, that only 7,000 or so are actually legitimate. Can you imagine whittling something down like that to say only 7,000 out of 700,000, only 6,900 or something like that are considered to be what they call legitimate and even amongst those 7,000, there are still grades of which there are still that category of that is called naif or weak. We accept it. We think it. he did say it, but it's still weak. We don't have all of the proof for it. Or there might be just one guy during the time of Muhammad who said this or, or one cousin of uh, Uncle Puki Abdul or somebody who said, yeah, yeah, he said it, he said it. So let's put that in the hadiths too. And we'll work it out sometime later, because what we're saying to the people is designed to corral them as cattle. That was the purpose for many of those hadiths, to control the masses of uneducated and unaware Muslims at that time. And that's still the reason they teach you most of those hadiths. That's why you still beat your women if you do, you dummy, because you're looking at some hadith that said most women are hell by they're destined for hell. Now, if you're not Muslim and you're listening to me, I'm sorry you're here tonight to hear this part. But that's what a hadith says, that the prophet said that he was uh, sent to, he was shown hell. He was shown hell, then he was shown paradise. But first he was shown hell, and he said that the majority of his inhabitants were women. Now, how are women supposed to feel behind that? And ain't nothing in there proving that. Are the majority of women right now on earth the ones who are causing the most hell on earth? Hell no, it's the men that are doing that. So how are the women going to be the majority of inhabitants of hell? You lying, you know, boy, you glad you in the Ramadan. But you're still a lying bastard. That's an English word. You can find that in the dictionary. It means you don't know who your mommy and daddy are. And you certainly don't. Because it's certainly not the prophet and it's certainly not the ummah of Muhammad. That's your mother and father. Allah has Muhammad in the Quran say that he is not the father of any of your men. <laughs> He's not the father of any of your sons. That's in the Quran for a reason. Now, didn't mean to take that much time, but this must be important for Allah to keep me here like this. So Baqarah is a young cow, but it's also speaking to the vicar. The vicar. This is where we get the word vicarious. You've heard of a vicarious experience? What is a vicarious experience? It's an experience that you have by simply watching somebody else do something and identifying with their actions. 
It's like going to the movies, watching your favorite actor, John Wayne, uh, you know, whoever, you know, um, what's the one that just died, uh, Ra Raquel Welch, you know, whoever your favorite actors and actresses used to be when you were younger, male and female. You go to the movies and John Wayne is shooting and killing the Indians and all that. And you you see in yourself and they're killing the Indians. Or I know some African-Americans who went to the movies to watch uh, Tarzan beat up Africans in Africa and the black folks in the audience identified with Tarzan. Kill them Tarzan, kill them Africans, kill them. Amazing job they've done on our psyche in the last 100, 200 years that we're now, that's why you need the Quran to undo that mess, to undo, just get rid of those cobwebs of, from yesterday. That's why we're so fearful now of anything new because the white man hasn't approved it, so to speak. And you're gonna lift your head up <laughs> and you're gonna see what's beginning to happen right now amongst you Nunetics learners. There are so-called white people who are joining us and loving this. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Omar Zaid, you know, and our friend over there right now. There are people sitting on the line right now who are so-called white people who are loving this because they know it is free of so-called racism. And there are women who are loving what Instructor Bilal is talking about because it is free from sexism and chauvinism because it is hitra and there's no racism in nature. There's no, no sexism in nature. There's form and functionality in nature, and that's it. The way a thing looks and the way a thing performs. So vicarious means that you're identifying with it, but it's not you. What do they say about the Pope's seat in Rome? That he is sitting in the place of Christ until Christ returns. So he is the vicar because he's, he's a stand-in. He's, he's, uh, he's not Jesus, just like you're not Raquel Welch. <laughs> you're not John Wayne. But everything they do, you just go, wow, yeah, yeah. And when they kill the hero, oh, you just boo-hooing because you identify vicariously with that hero or with that character. See? You just sitting there crying, can't get the rest of your day done because you know who your star was in that movie. And they just died in the movie, not in real life. Not to mention when they die in real life, like a Michael Jackson, you had girls committing suicide over his death because they've been identifying with him as his boyfriend or his future husband or future wife or whatever, vicariously. So it was all in the mind is what I'm saying. And to say that Jesus sits in the place of God is creating Jesus as a vicarious experience. So kill that heifer, I believe the Quran is saying. Kill that bakara. And the Jews were asking Moses all kinds of questions. Uh, what, what, what color is she? See, that's how you know that racism was involved in their scheme. For them to even ask that question, well, what color are you talking about? And he said, a uh, fawn colored heifer. That's where they translated in Yusuf Ali. Ain't no fawn. Who knows what a fawn colored heifer is? <laughs> no. If he had said a, a, a golden brown colored heifer, he would have been correct. It says saffron. That's the color. Saffron. It's like a brown mixed with gold. See, when you understand what Allah is saying in the Quran, you can put your finger right on the culprit who established the language of this world. Yeah. How now, brown cow? The Hebrew said, it's a red cow. The Quran says, it's a saffron colored cow. And Allah was pointing directly to the culprits and also directly to the result of their scheme, which was profit, gold. A golden colored scheme. That's the one I want you to kill. Well, they all look alike. Which ones are we looking to <laughs> slaughter Moses? Uh, you know, the one that's not too old, not too young, but of middling age. Now do as you were told. Oh my goodness, during Ramadan, I'm going to break that whole scheme down for you. If you pay attention to the up and coming lectures that I'm going to be having uh, sponsored by Masjid Allah in Philadelphia, that starts tomorrow. It'll be every Saturday and Sunday morning from 11 o'clock a.m. to 12.30 p.m. my time, Eastern Standard Time. 
I don't know how you found out about this class, but if it was through Facebook or through an email from me, you'll know or have the link for these up and coming weekend Ramadan lectures where I'm going to be breaking down so many concepts in the Quran that it'll eventually end up in a book. Maybe the month after Ramadan, it'll be available. But try to be there live. That's when your brain is able to soak in most of it. So we'll go through those series of questions that they asked Musa. And then lastly, it says that they ended up doing it, but not with the not with good right cheer. You know, they, they weren't happy about it. They ended up slaughtering her, but they slaughtered her just to resurrect her later on in history. They resurrected her amongst the Western racist people. <laughs> yeah, the Western racist people, the white people. They resurrected that same racist, sexist scheme, but amongst Europeans. It began in India amongst brown people. You get it? A brownish golden heifer. You don't know how Allah speaks to the human intellect when all you have to do is think about what he's saying. But if you don't have the proper terminology because they're mistranslating the Quran itself, now you're back at first base, trying to make it around to third and then back to home. So stay with us. Join this new Netics class. I'll leave a link. In the description, as they say, yeah, to let you know how you can become a part of this new Netics experience every single week, especially beginning with Ramadan. And don't accept religion as a vicarious experience. Don't accept religion saying the Arabs got it. All I have to do is take Shahada and be done because, you know, the religion is in their hands. I'll just live through them. How do you live through the Arabs? You become a Muslim and you start all of a sudden wearing a turban for no reason. You start wearing a long thawb in the middle of America, in the middle of the winter. Here you are with a thawb. I'm not uh, talking bad about you. I'm just saying you got to understand what's been taking place psychologically on the part of people who wanted to psychologically and emotionally have that grip on you, dominate you psychologically and emotionally. You start speaking with an accent and you grew up in bed Brooklyn. You didn't have no Arabic accent when you grew up. It was only after you took Shahad Attain that you started attaining an accent. You need to put down that foolishness. Nature is going to get rid of you. I'm just telling you the straight and honest truth. Nature is about to wipe the earth clean of everything that is anti-fitra, including ideas knowledge that is not fitra based nature right now is erasing the blackboard and all of that so don't live vicariously through anybody be a muslim for yourself and even the word khalifa that famous word from the quran in surah 2 also khalifa in the same way as bakara is a young cow the khalifa is actually a young adam this is the making of Adam when Allah mentions that he's about to make a khalifa fil art, a khalifa in the earth. Look at these consonants. The KH consonant, kha, is a guttural, like the off Q in Baqarah. The L is a liquid, just like the R in Baqarah. And the F is a labial, just like the ba or B in Baqarah. So khalifa and Baqarah are going to have related meanings the people under moses call that heifer in admiration for all beholders they just like staring at the baka the baka took their attention so much that they couldn't take their eyes off of it that's what that word means nazara they, they couldn't take their word, not their, pardon me, that they couldn't take their eyes off of the. It's like watching an accident in, in the street or on the highway as you're driving. The purpose that the reason people rub a neck on the other side and why the other side is the side that's all jammed up in the traffic jam and not the side of the accident is because the people over here have to look at the accident, see if there's any blood, you know, see if anybody died. The ambulance is there and the stretcher is there and they, they, they almost get into an accident themselves, rubbernecking. That's what they call it, rubbernecking. They can't, something in the human nature has to look at it. And that's what Allah is saying about the Baqarah. 
that it's the admiration of all beholders. When you behold it, you can't take your head away from it. Your eyes, you can't take it away from it. And that's why Bakara is consonantally connected with Kamara, because Kamara is the fullness of the moon as it reflects the light of the sun. And on a moon, man, my goodness, if you catch a good full moon, you can sit out there in your front yard and, uh, you know, just swinging on your swing, just looking at that moon. People used to do that centuries ago. And uh, even in more recent times in, in history, you'd hear about people talking about the man in the moon. People used to wonder all of the time before uh, rockets were sent in that vicinity. What's up there? What's on there? Are those craters or all those? What are those up there? Moon's got measles. What's happening up there, right? People always wondered about the moon. It was, it was a mystery, a mist story for most people, but they couldn't take their eyes off it. They'd be walking and the moon looked like it's following them. You, you've done that. The moon looked like it's following you. You say, well, I can't take my eyes off this moon. Is this moon moving? You stop, the moon stops. You start, the moon starts moving again with you. Oh man, how beautiful this creation is. Let's keep going. We also have a consonantally connected word called felak. The F is a labial, like the F in Khalifa. The L is a liquid, just like the L in Khalifa. In Khalifa. And the Qaf is a guttural, just like the Kha in Khalifa. So they're going to have not the same meaning, but related meanings. I know this is blowing a lot of your minds out there who have heard this for the first time. Where in the world did he get this? You should be asking yourself, why in the world would Allah give us this? That's the real question you need to ask. Not where did I get it? You need to ask the question, why did Allah give it to us? Because when he gave it to me, he gave it to us. And when I say us, I ain't talking about black people. I ain't talking about African-American, Negro, colored. I'm not talking about that people. You, all those people I just mentioned who are supposed to be one people, you have had your fill of leaders and help. You don't, you're not getting any more. The help that Allah is sending today no matter who's representing that help, it's going to be for true humans, wherever you find them. Nunetics is not for the black man. Those days are over as of Elijah Muhammad, Martin Luther King, that era right there, Malcolm X and all that. That's where you blew that blessing. You ain't getting no more, not from God. You need to read the Quran and see where people have been cut off from the goodness of God and his blessings. Just read about those people and then compare what Allah says about them to your circumstances. And you'll see that you are also cut off and beyond cut off, African-Americans are now actually cursed. Where did you get that instructed Bilal? From your leader, Imam W.D. Muhammad. That's what he said. He said African-Americans are cursed people now. You know why? Because you disrespected God. You cried out to God during slavery. He freed you. And then you went from there to the party. To shake your butt in the club. I'm advancing the story now because there's the whole Jim Crow period when we were struggling, trying to maintain our dignity. And we got our dignity. Laws were passed. Legislation was passed. Adam Clayton Powell, people fighting for your rights in different parts of the United States. And when you finally got those rights, you said, now I have a right to sit with white people. That was called integration. That was a trick played on the majority of American people. Every other people come here looking to reside in the community that looks and favors and, 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 and thinks like and dresses like and eats like they do. Whether you're talking about people coming from India, they like being in an Indian community. They will establish one if there's not one. If you're talking about the Polish, they want to live in a Polish community. You understand? There's going to be less prejudice and problems. You can find work among the Polish, building houses, construction, whatever you're going to do, opening up restaurants and so forth. But the Polish have their own unique community. The Africans come here and not only do they have uniquely African communities, they have uniquely Nigerian African communities or Ghanaian or Senegalese African communities. But the African American is the only people who just want to be here and feel good about sitting in somebody else's restaurant. Buying a car from somebody else's manufacturer. Where's your manufacturing company? Where's your airline company? 
These are the questions that Elijah Muhammad was asking. These are the questions that Imam W.D. Muhammad left here asking. You're supposed to have your own. That's not racism. That's common sense. So we left that dignity of people fighting for, for that with all of their errors and all of their misgivings and all of that. They weren't perfect people, but they were putting themselves on the line, literally, for our lives, our collective life as a people. And we turned our backs on their efforts. And now we're under a curse. And the only ones who will not be under that curse are the people who are in the kinds of circles that we are now forming, that are concentrating on the fitra, number one, and on the redevelopment of our true human soul that Imam Muhammad said would be eliminated soon. He said that in his lifetime, and it's already happening, that the soul is being eliminated through what he called the great elimination of the soul. You want to be in that pack? Or you want to be in the new world where people are, are now rediscovering their true humanity? That's what this is. And the Quran, there's no better strategy for reestablishing the true human than the guidance of the Quran. Let's continue. This is beautiful if you understand it. You see, the Bakara is a young cow in the same way that the Khalifa is the introduction of Adam. It speaks about the Khalifa first, fil ard, meaning in the earth. That tells me right there that the Khalifa represents the same thing that a seed represents. They translated Khalifa on the earth, but it doesn't say alel ard. It says fil ard. Fi means inside of something. So Allah was planting the Khalifa in the earth for exponential growth in time once the proper conditions and circumstances presented themselves to bring the potential out of that Khalifa that would eventually become our true human nature called Adam in the Quran. Not an individual in history. Who knows who the first man was, the first human, or who knows? Who cares? What, what, what good is that going to do you to know who the first physical man is created by God? How do you know he didn't create groups of people at once? We got to get out of this dumb way of approaching religion. And I will give you harsh words in order to shock you out of that ignorance. Trying to find out who the first man was so you can claim racial superiority. He must have been African. Check the people who are saying that and, and, and ask them about their accomplishments, especially any recent ones. What have you been doing on this earth with all of that knowledge about you being the first man on earth? You should be ashamed to tell people that. <laughs> and then they look at what you're doing and not doing. Well, damn, that's what people who were here first. Yeah, that's what any people who were here first do. What does the baby do? The baby was here before the teenager and the adult. Who gets more accomplished in this world? It's the, teen, it's the ones who came later, <laughs> not the baby. <laughs> so you were here first. All right, so you're the baby in, civil, in world civilization. That doesn't mean you accomplished anything to speak of. You were just the first introduction. Look at the Khalifa. Are you going to make one who's going to create mischief and shed the blood? Look at his, look at his uh, prognostic, <laughs> prognosis <laughs> from the angels. You creating a blood shedder, Allah? Yeah, well, that's what the baby is. The baby comes out of the womb of his mother shedding blood because the Khalifa is an infant. <laughs> oh, God. Whew, we're having a good time tonight. Alhamdulillah. Those of you who needed to go break your fast, go do so. At least take a sip of water, some tea or something. Apple. Now, look at how young Felak is. It's the young dawning of the light. And what it is doing in the same way that the Khalifa is shedding blood, in the same way that El Bakara is shedding its redness, or we would say in this case, its brownness, its goldenness. See, it's giving that up. Felak is shedding the night when the redness begins to appear in the sky. They call that dawn. And most Muslims don't know the difference between felak and fajr. We use them interchangeably. 
Thelok is the shedding of the night sky. As soon as that light appears that we call redness, before seeing the actual sun, we see a reddish glow above the horizon. That's Felok. Fajr advances the daylight, which brings with it an interruption in peace. See, this is the difference between the two. Fajr advances daylight. Once that distinction is made in the horizon for Fajr, what it is attempting to do is quickly advance and increase the light, the daylight. But when it does, it ostensibly brings behind that an increase in corruption. And it's a corruption that interrupts the peace. Where are you getting that? It's Dr. Bilal. From the surah that speaks about the night of power, Laylat al-Qadr, al-Qadr. We're going to be talking about that during this series of weekend lectures on Ramadan, during Ramadan. Peace it is until the rise of Fajr. Salam, peace. Hiya it is. She is. Salam, hiya, hatta, until. Met la il, the getting tall. Met tall, met tall. See? Hiya hatta met la il, met la il. That's where they get the word tall because it's rising. What's rising? Fajr. What is fujur? That's when a lot of trouble begins for the soul because the soul at that point is between light and darkness. It's between the rising of the sun where you're able to see clearly and that midway point where it's still kind of murky outside and every move on the part of a creature in the woods looks like uh, something spooky or something that's about to attack you. That's fujur in the soul. In the sky, it's when the sun just begins to start rising and you still can't distinguish regular objects from things that might be out to get you. So Fajr, when the full light of the sun comes out, then criminals are able to see their way clearly if they have negative intentions against society. So most crimes are committed not at night as most people would like for you to believe that evil lurks in the darkness. No, it doesn't. Evil lurks in the broad spectrum of light that appears. Find out when most bank robberies take place. It'd be something like midday. <laughs> you understand? Find out when most rapes and murders are committed. It ain't going to be in the dead of night, no two in the morning kind of stuff. Those things are going to be taking place right in the broad daylight. The Quran speaks about that, how lewdness was being perpetrated on the highways and byways in the broad daylight. That's your fajr. You thought it was a morning ritual prayer. Surprise. We're going to come into much more valuable connections in the logic of the Quran, if you just stay with us. Look at the word Arab and Arabia, the language. The ayn is a guttural, just like the J in Fajr is a guttural. The Ra is the same as the Ra in Fajr. And the Bait is a labial, just like the F in Fajr. So Arabia is not the language of an ethnic group in Arabia. As the Quran presents this word, Arabia, Mubin, clear Arabic, it is the dawning of language that is connected to the fitrah, the dawning of communication that is coming directly from Allah's fitrah to the human intellect and to the human heart and therefore the human soul. Allah speaks to the human being not through man-invented languages like Arabic and Hebrew and Spanish. That's not how Allah speaks. Allah speaks through the language of creation, which is frequency. Allah speaks to human beings. Allah inspires human beings, especially the prophets, through the communication of frequencies that match the frequencies that he placed into their fitra-based framework. 
Did you know that your very brain operates based on frequency modulation? Based on what they call waves, beta waves, alpha waves, gamma waves, delta waves, etc. There are waves that are operating your brain that take your brain into certain sequential frequencies that are best fit for certain kinds of activities, whether it's sleep, a full wakefulness, meditation. Hmm? Yeah, there's a wave that's set aside specifically for advancing you during meditation, meditative pauses, quietude, concentration, contemplation, meditation, those things I spoke about as being part and parcel of the salat. We're going to talk about all of that during this series of Ramadan lectures. So Allah knows how to communicate directly with your fitra-based frequencies. That's what Ramadan is about as a purpose. Ein as a letter means the I and represents insight into something, but insight that occurs because of the straining of the intellect to perceive and understand. Ein. See, when the eye strains, it produces moisture. Tears sometimes becomes red even sometimes. When you strain them, you stay awake trying to study for that college exam, man, and you just tired as I don't know what, and your eyes are straining to stay awake. Sometimes they get wet. That's why the same letter Ein also means fountain. Look it up in the dictionary. It means fountain, that which produces water. And that water is straining through the pipes underground to reach your fountain when you hit it in the park, turn it on to drink from it. Hmm? So Ein represents strenuous activity that produces insight in the intellect. See? The ra means movement, but it means evolutionary movement, movement that produces an upwards climb. Ra. That's why they saw it as the sun, because the sun begins at the horizon and then the sun takes on an uphill climb, an evolutionary advancement towards being king of the hill at 12 o'clock noon. It's king of the hill and there's no shadow to be seen because the sun has shown you everything. <laughs> See? <laughs> so Ra represents evolutionary movement. So now we're talking about insight into the evolutionary movement of something. What is that something? Whatever the letter B represents. See? Arab. Arab. And B. That letter is actually the letter bait, not just ba, bait, just like they truncated yad to become ya at the end of the alphabet. They also truncated bait to become ba, the sound of the sheep. Ba, ba, that's what they wanted out of the population. Obedient followers. But that's not what this letter means. This letter. When we call it bait, that's the normal Arabic word for house. But there's another standard word in Arabic for house. Most Arabs won't call their regular house bait. That's not what they call bait. Bait is a very special house. Even in the Quran, when it speaks about el bait, it's not. No. See, it's talking about a very special house. Now, the special house that this letter is referring to is the house that we call creation itself. These planetary bodies are called houses in the zodiac language. They're called houses. When the moon is in the seventh house and Jupiter aligns with Mars, then peace will guide the planets and love will steer the stars. This is the dawning of the age of Aquarius, the water bearer. We're living in that now, the age of Aquarius. We're in it. We're out of Pisces. We're on the cusp between Pisces and Aquarius. The two fish swimming in opposite directions, that's what produced the last 6,000 years worth of Earth's activities, opposition, racism. So that's why Black Lives Matter couldn't get that match 
They couldn't, they couldn't get that fire lit. They wanted race wars in America. To hell with everybody except black people. Black people matter. Black lives matter. Only black lives. I said black lives matter. And you better, you better put that on your lawn. They had the so-called white people putting black lives matter on the front of their houses, on the lawn, written in the windows. They so scared that black folks were going to come by and say, You, you you don't like you don't you don't like us you don't like white people we're we're with you all oh, white women wearing t-shirts black lives matter i know i'm stepping on some of your toes out there but if you were smart as the day you were born and you were very intelligent then and you called yourself a supporter of the language and logic of imam wadathuddin muhammad you should have never used the term black in the first place he got rid of that in the early 80s, I believe, when he introduced Bilali in late 70s. He said, stop calling yourselves black. Say, you're not a color. You're not a skin color. He said, is your identity no bigger than skin color? You don't even call your dog a black dog. If it's a lavender retriever or whatever, or if it's, if it's a shepherd, a black shepherd, they say, well, what kind of dog do you have? Oh, I have a black dog. Come on, man. What kind of dog? Oh, I'm sorry, I have a, a shepherd. <laughs> you see, you give your dog more, more dignity than that. I have a black cat. Really, a black horse. No, the horse has a breed that distinguishes it from other horses. You don't have nothing that distinguishes you except your black skin color. And look at the lie behind that, because most of us are not physically black. We're physically brown and different shades of brown. So how did you become black people? You don't understand the schemes of Satan. That's how it happened. He did it to make sure that you matched up in history, in the now, and into the unforeseeable future. He wanted to make sure that you matched up with what the Bible was speaking on as the children of Ham, the cursed black son of Noah. He had three sons, Ham, Japheth, Shem. He said, Black Ham is now going to be the progenitor for all people in Africa of African descent. Ham, you are called Hamites in the books. Japheth would be the progenitor for all people of European descendancy, Europeans. And Shem would be the progenitor for all people of Asian descent, including the Jews. According to their logic. So they divided the world up into three colors at that time black, white, red. Black African, white European, red Asian. Then another social scientist came along and said, no, three is not enough. Let's divide it into five. <laughs> then they established black, brown, red yellow and white. And they came up with that saying, if you're black, stay back. If you're brown, you can still stick around. If you're yellow, you're a little bit mellow. If you're red, you still might get ahead. But if you're white, just know that you are all right. And we went for that okie-doke. And we started calling ourselves black, first in Spanish, negro, that's Spanish, negro, and then we said, well, let's go all of the way. Just use the English language. Let's call ourselves Black. And you can thank Elijah Muhammad for that because he was the main force behind us stopping calling ourselves Negro, which meant Black, already in Spanish. And he said he was bringing a message to the Black man in America. So we went for his language, which was a symbolic language. He was not speaking about Black, at least his teacher, W.D. Farad, was not establishing Black as a racial skin color melatonin, uh, melatonin or melanin, pardon me, melatonin feature. Because he would have been out of his mind to do so, knowing that miscegenation had rendered most of us brown, dark brown, uh, middle brown, light skin brown. Some of us like Adam Clayton Powell, you couldn't tell the difference between us and a white man hair and all. So what was this black man that 
Mr. Farad and Elijah Muhammad were talking about. They were talking metaphorically and metaphysically. When you understand what black means in religion, I'm talking about amongst the higher up people who understand symbolism and color classifications in scripture. So Allah had to come behind that with the Quran and speak about the mountains. He said, among the mountains, there are those that are capped with white. And there are others that are capped with red. And there are others that are capped with black. And then he adds this intense in hue. He doesn't add that to the red and the white. <laughs> He's trying to give you a, a, a way out of your stupidity when you're thinking about yourself as, a, as, a, as an inferior race. No, it's intense in hue. You, you have the capability and the qualifications to spawn a lot of things that take place on this earth. Right now, you so-called black people are the reason why the rest of the world got rhythm now. Go back and look at American Bandstand from the 1950s and the 1960s, when most of those teenagers couldn't keep a beat with their fingers, much less their legs and arms. But I saw some stuff yesterday coming from some European-American children. Teenagers, young adults, man, they were out dancing and all of that robot stuff and AI moves and all of that, just like we do. As a matter of fact, many of our people have lost it. Now you find us on the dance floor as young people just, you know, doing a Snoop Doggy Dog move. You know, that's about all we can do. But we come from a, a generation of James Brown, Wilson Pickett, and Sam Cooke. <laughs> you know, man, we were doing gymnastics on stage. Joe Tex, you know, the Temptations, you know, the Jackson Five. You know. <laughs> we were from that generation of people who knew how to move. We had energy, energy, and we lost it on the most part. We used to like to dress up before we performed. Now we just come in our jeans, saggy jeans or whatever, you know, whatever, open shirt or closed shirt or whatever, the hat turned backwards and all of that. So we've lost a lot because our soul has been affected by the language of these schemers. So Allah is trying to reconstitute us in the Quran by telling you that all of those three categories have dignity with Allah. But you got to look at that black one because that's where the intensity is. Why is there intensity in the black? Because the intensity of the sun hit that one the most. People of the sun, it hit you the most. You were the outdoorsy people. Everything you did was outdoors. It wasn't, it wasn't cold enough to, to run you inside of a cave or inside of a hut. You were outdoors almost all year long in many parts of Africa and the Caribbean and these places. So you have to understand what Allah is speaking to. And Allah is just, he's fair. Just keep that in mind. So none of what Allah is saying is racist or sexist. It's justice. Let's continue. So insight into the evolutionary movement in the house called creation. That's what Arabiya Mubin is. It's clear insight into the movement that Allah has clocked into the evolution of creation itself. So you have to look at creation, study creation, scientifically categorize creation in order to know how Allah is speaking to your intellect. That's Arabiya, the voice, so to speak, or the language, if you will, of Allah, not Arabic. It's contained within the codes. It's contained within the sound of the phonemes. But all languages contain those codes and contain those phonemes. I just showed you combinations of words in both Arabic and English that contain the same messages to the mind. So it's not a particular racial or ethnic group that holds the codes and the keys exclusively that the rest of the world has to go to to get it. No, the rest of the world has to go to the Quran and learn the language of creation itself called El Fitra. Let's continue. So Ramadan represents the resetting and restoration of your body's Fitra frequency. That's the most important statement I'm going to be making today. I'm going to repeat it. Ramadan, that sun, moon, and earth phenomenon, 
represents the resetting and restoration of your bodies, your physical, mental, and moral and spiritual bodies. It's designed to return all of those fabulous bodies, those precious bodies back to their fit from frequency. Just like when you were a baby responding to your mother's frequencies. The English word frequent with its consonants F, R, and Q is related to the Quranic Arabic word furqan with its fa, ra, qaf. A word that Allah uses in Surah 2, Ayah 185, that speaks on Ramadan. Now let's do this and conclude for the night, inshallah. Look at what Allah says. Allah says, Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an. Listen carefully. Hudan Linnas, stop there. If I didn't give you any more, this is enough for you tonight. They translate this word shahru as meaning month, and that's not the definitive meaning for shahru. I'm not going to give it to you tonight. You'll have to tune in to the Masjid al Law webinars this weekend to get the true meaning, and I'll give it to you tomorrow. Shahru. The first meaning for shahru is not month. Ramadan, I told you what that word means. el we know what that is. Fihi, in it. Masculine, not fiha, fihi. el Quranu. We say we know what that is. Now look at the purpose. Not psalm, not siam, not fasting. Who then? Guidance. Not for muslimun or mu'minun. For li and nas. Mankind. That's the purpose. If I said nothing else, you should be straight. Ramadan is the month, and you see they put month in brackets for a reason. If the word meant month, listen carefully. If shahru meant month, why would they put it in brackets in the translation? You ever ask yourself these questions as you're reading these translations? If that's what it means, that's what it means. Why would they put it in brackets? You only put something in brackets if you are inferring that it means that, but it doesn't really mean that. And these scholars who are worth their weight in translation, in translation gold they know that shahru means something different than just month. They pointed your attention to the month because they wanted to point your attention to the moon. Maybe, I, maybe I've said too much already. I don't know. Anybody out there want me to continue or should I stop here because it's getting too heavy? Come on with it, brother, man. Continue. Cautious with the truth. Keep going. All right. Can I get a witness? <laughs> Plenty of them in this group. Well, let, let's keep on. We, let's keep on with it. All right, here we go. Mute your phones. You heard of uh, the Shah of Iran, I'm sure. Those of you who are old enough to remember the Shah of Iran. Obviously, the leader, one of the leaders in Iran. This was during the 70s, I believe. Well, Shah, S H A H, it means ruler and king. The Shah of Iran or Iran was the leader of Iran, the king of Iran. Because that's what the word refers to. It refers to leaders. Leaders and leadership. Get my book, The Night of Cosmic Power, for the detailed explanation of this word and what it's referring to. 
Suffice it to say tonight, that is not referring to a physical 30-day month. Allah knows very well how to put the number 30. All, if you wanted to say months, this word shahru is used in other parts of the Quran. And they're still mistranslating it as a month, except in one other case where they translate it differently. So why would it mean month over here? And then when you skip to a different surah, it means something different over there. Because they had to make it mean what they wanted it to mean for their particular ideology to become predominant. And their ideology was suggesting that Muslims who read the Quran become moon worshipers. Instructor, you've gone too far now. You're calling us, no, I'm not calling you anything. I'm telling you what the social schemers who designed what you believe to be your religion of Islam, what they designed for you to follow. And they intended for you to be moon worshipers. That's why you're so busy out there looking for the moon. You're not supposed to be looking for the moon to begin Ramadan. You're supposed to be looking for the blank sky. That's what signals a new moon to come. Your focus is not on the slither. It's on the night. Which in the Quran is called Laylatul Qadr. The night of power. Get that book. <laughs> the night of cosmic power. And you'll understand better what I'm talking about. Somebody remind me to give people that information and I will include it in the link below when this appears, inshallah, on YouTube. Now, man, oh man, I have to take my time like this because I'm straining more to stop saying certain things than to say certain things because most of you will not be ready for what I have that appears and says, say this. And I have to discipline myself enough to say they're not ready for that yet. I'm not trying to say I'm some special wizard or something who's getting communication from. No, 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 no. I'm just a student like all of you. I'm a student like Imam W.D. Muhammad and others. And he himself had to weigh very heavily what he said to his people because some of them will become brain damaged, cogitating upon some of the things that he did say. Not to mention the, 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 the loads of things that I know he would have and could have said, but didn't say at the time because he felt, as he said on many occasions, that we were not ready. So, Hoot and holler. Pardon me? I said a hoot and a holler. Alhamdulillah. And hoot is consonantally connected to hootan. <laughs> yeah. All right. So follow this logic now to its logical conclusion. Muhammad the prophet never recognized any star and crescent as a symbol for the Muslim nation or ummah. He never presented anybody with a flag or some kind of national symbol to represent or to be represented by the crescent moon and a star placed within its field, which would make it automatically a non fitra symbol, being that the star is placed in such close proximity to the crescent, it would mean that if you were seeing this in real nature, the star would have to be in front of the moon, because the moon is a full circle, although the dark part of it is still blanked out. The crescent is there, but there's still a circle, even though the crescent is there. So if you place that star within the proximity of the rest of the dark part of the moon, then you're saying that the star is in front of the moon. You get it? Now, why is this important for you to understand? Dear Muslims, listen carefully to this logic. When you understand what the moon means in their language scheme, and when you understand what the star means in their language scheme, you'll understand perfectly what the scheme actually is and why you should get the hell out of it. I don't care if your star and resting ring costs you $5,000 like the one Malcolm had. 
I would stop wearing it. I can't tell you what to do. I would stop wearing it. If it's a pendant around my neck, if it's a picture, a portrait on my wall, if it, I don't care what it is. If it, if it has a star and a crescent, you're following the scheme of the people who sought to reestablish out of paganism amongst Muslims after the prophet died. That's what you're studying. That's what you're representing. Whenever you have that star crescent on top of your masjid, why do you think Imam Muhammad told those people in New York City, I was there when he said it, to take that star crescent off of the top of this masjid? He said it is un-Islamic as a symbol. Well, the rest of you didn't hear that in the country. I heard I was there in New York, but I thought that reverberated throughout the country. It should have. It's 1983 or so when he said it. And most people complied and took it down. But you have to investigate the deeper reason why Imam Muhammad rejected that symbol. He didn't get a chance to tell you all of what I'm telling you. But I bet you if he were here today in 2023, he'd be sitting right here in the webinar agreeing with me. And at Bilal, he hit it again out the park. He's right about that. That that is an un-Islamic symbol that was adopted from another group of pagans <laughs> in the world and brought into Islam after the passing of the prophet, brought in during the crusades against the Christians, against the Catholic Church. They raised the symbol, Jesus the Christ dead on a cross. They said, we're going to raise the symbol of light star, moon, and sun, or whatever, you know, crescent and star, whatever it was. And the innocent Muslims did that. But the nefarious ones came behind it, the ones who were perpetrating or faking the funk, as I like to say, as Muslims. And they said, we can use this move here. Let's just play upon the tiny brains of these innocent Muslims and take that star and crescent and make it into what we want to say. What did they want to say? They wanted to say that the moon, again, It represents that which is pulling on your emotional waters, that which is magnetizing you, attracting you towards it. That's what the moon represents. And it's pulling on your emotionality, and it's also pulling on your moral judgment, how you judge things morally. That's what the moon represents. So what is the star? The star represents the leading people in religion, what they call the saints, the gurus, if you will, in any religion. But we're talking now about Islam. So the stars would be those leading imams and muftis and mullahs and ulima and people in those groups right there. Not all of them, but too many of them. The leading people who pass down fatwas. They don't like what you said. They want your head chopped off. They pass a fatwa. This one is an enemy of Islam. Go get him. And people have died behind the fatwas of these so-called Muslim ulima and mullahs and scholars and imams and these people. People have literally lost their lives, lost their literal heads behind people who didn't like what this one said. And Salman Rushdie said something else. We have to kill him. The one who said number 19 is a fabrication. They went and killed him. So as soon as you say something that they say disagrees with their particular logic or their particular school of thought, the Sunni school, the Shia school, then they're after you. <laughs> they don't believe la ikraha fi deen. They don't believe that there should be no compulsion in, in the deen, like Allah said, that truth stands out clearly from error. So let him who believe, believe. Let him who disbelieves, disbelieve. That's the Quran. So how come if you disagree? And sometimes it's just disagreeing with one point. <laughs> That's different than their point. And they send people out, goons and goon squads to come get you. Those are the saints that are doing that. Those are the shining stars of the deen. You get it? They are the stars. But look at where they are positioned in that symbolism. They are positioned in front of the moon because one of the other meanings for the moon is the prophet himself. The prophet who's just reflecting the light of the guidance. See, as the moon reflects the light of the sun, the prophet is reflecting the light of Allah's guidance. And then the saints, the scholars come and they say, the moon is a, is a bygone thing. The prophet, he's gone, he's dead. 
we're here to take over now. How do we know that? Based on their same symbolism. Because the moon that they give you, you Muslim worlds, the moon they give you is in its last phase. It's not in its first quarter. It's in the last quarter. The last <laughs> slither, actually. <laughs> That's the moon. They, what are they saying about the light of the prophet amongst them? That the prophet's light is waning and therefore our light has to take over. So we're going to jump in front of the prophet. That's how the hadith became more important to you than the Quran. That's how. They made it more important. They have a, a, a logic amongst the scholars, some of them that say that uh, if the hadith say something different than what the Quran says, that the hadith abrogate the Quran itself. Have you heard that one? And these are inacceptable volumes of hadith, such as Muslim and Bukhari, Dawood, and these others that we accept as gospel. If they said it, we believe it. We don't care how strange it is. They said the majority of women are held down. If they said the prophet said that, the prophet must have said it because Muslim and Bukhari said it. You haven't even investigated on your own who this Muslim and Bukhari actually are. And if they, in fact, said it, or was it said about them, put in their mouths and then published you can't even tell me where Muslim, you think Muslim is just a Muslim. Muslim is the name of a scholar who established these hadiths and collected them and made them popular. And Bukhari was even more popular than him. But who are these people? Where were they from? Were they from Mecca? No. Were they from Medina? No. Were they from any of the Arab countries? No. Where were they from? They were all from Persia. And Bukhari by way of Russia. And these are the people that you trust your Muslim life with and will argue people down like instructor Benjamin Bilal in your own mind. Nobody has ever come to me to argue about these points, but I see them arguing on YouTube with each other. The Sunnis against the Shi'is and the, the Quranists, or whatever that's supposed to be, against the, you know, the, the Hadith, the, you know, toters. And uh, I see them arguing back. I'm not a Quranite or Qurani, the Quranist or whatever that is. I don't have to put Quran in what I am. I'm a true human, a Muslim, obedient to the word and guidance of Allah. That's it. I don't need any other adjective behind that. I don't need to paste my Quran on my chest or on my back as a cape and say, look at me, world. This is what I represent. You don't have to do that, Muslim. Listen carefully now. This is your, this is your moment to be saved from that. So the moon represented the waning effects of the prophet's life itself. And it's being replaced by the bright shining light of their stars called saints and scholars. At least Mr. W.D. Farad, the teacher of Elijah Muhammad, pulled a serious whammy on the traditional Muslim world by presenting a star and crescent also, but he brought the crescent from the beginning stages. He had the star there, but he brought the crescent from the other side, the beginning side the right side, where the moon advancements begin, the increments begin from the right side as a crescent. But that doesn't make the sign halal. All of it should still be thrown out into the garbage. And you tell Minister Louis Farrakhan and the people who represent that still, that I said it. You'd make more progress in the world if you would divest yourself of that contaminated symbol. Whenever you see a new crescent and a star in the fitra, the star is actually Venus. Venus. And it's always much higher than the interior of the moon. Give me one moment. One moment.
See, I don't know if you can see that. You probably can't. But that's a picture that one of our daughters took last night of the crescent moon and the star that's way up above it. That's what a real star and crescent looks like in the Fitra. <laughs> in the Fitra. Let's continue. So look at what Allah is saying. That Ramadan, they say, is the month in which was sent down. Unzila means to send down or to rain down. Listen carefully. To send down, yes, but to rain down, like rain. And whatever nutrients are in the rain are the same nutrients that are in the Quran. So Ramadan is the month in which was sent down the Quran. Now, isn't it interesting that Allah doesn't say here that Ramadan is the month in which the Quran in which he began to send down the Qur'an. They say the Qur'an took 23 years. So how was Ramadan the month in which the Qur'an was sent down as if the entire Qur'an was sent in the month of Ramadan? You ever ask yourself that question? Allah could have easily said that Ramadan is the month in which I began sending down the Qur'an. Because as they say, it took 23 years to complete but it's because we're not understanding the ramifications of the words that Allah is choosing specifically and particularly for this revelation. So let's continue to investigate. And it as, as a guide, here is the reason for being in terms of the Quran. He sent it down. Listen now, he didn't say, I gotta keep reiterating these things. He didn't say Ramadan is the month in which was sent down the Quran and the, and the Sunnah. He didn't say Ramadan is the month in which was sent down the Quran and the Hadiths. He said Ramadan is the month in which was sent down the Quran. Why did he send down the Quran? As Hudan, as a guide, a guidance. To who? To Muslims? No, to mankind. You see how easy that is to figure out if you could push past the veneer that has been artificially established upon your eyes. Just pay meticulous attention to the wording. So what is the purpose of this Ramadan? Is it to fast? No. That's not the purpose. The purpose is what Allah is saying right here. The focus for the Muslim and for the true human, period, whether they're Muslim or not, technically speaking, the focus is the guidance of the Quran. What the Quran gives you as a guidance as points for guiding, leading, and directing your human life and your human endeavors. That's what the Quran is for, not for an ethnic group, not for a language group, for all mankind and nas. And nas, mankind. What else is the Quran sent down for? Also as clear, he puts in brackets signs because it doesn't say signs, but as clear, he says signs for what? Guidance and judgment between right and wrong. Now he's interpreting one word. And that word is al furqan that I spoke to you about earlier as being related consonantally to the English word frequency with its FRQ connection. So furqan represents frequencies that Allah sent the Quran down in order to modulate human frequencies. On the part of who, instructor? On the part of the people who are paying attention through concentration, meditation, and all of these other Asians. <laughs> paying attention to the Quran and its guidance. Not to fasting. That's not where your attention is supposed to be. That's voluntary. Oh, I just saw a big toe rise up. You stepped on my big toe with that one, instructor. I'm telling you, there is no language in this ayah that says that Allah mandated fasting. He recommends fasting, but the mandate is not on siyam or saum. And most of us don't know the difference between those two words, although both are translated as fasting. I'm starting slow because it's new to most of us. 
I'm not here to break any hearts. I'm here to advance your intellect and your sensitivities to expand your breast, as the Quran says. That's what was done for Muhammad. That should be happening for you and me also when we receive the Quran. Our breasts, meaning our concerns, our emotional concerns, our spiritual endeavors should broaden to include others now, not just us. Arise, dismantle, and warn the people. That's what Muhammad was told in the Quran. Don't stay up under that little mantle of Arab nationalism and all of that and male chauvinism. That's a small thing you wrapped up in. I mean, think about it at and arise, Allah said, and warn the people. That's our mission, particularly during Ramadan, because Ramadan represents the reset button that we need to push in order to begin from the beginning all over again, as though we never heard the message. That's what Ramadan is for, to respond to the call of Allah through his guidance called the Quran and to respond as though we know nothing about it. We never heard about it. We never thought about it because we just didn't contemplate. We didn't even know it existed. That's the mindset or the mind frame that you should be in every time you say you're going to experience Ramadan. So stop saying you're going to fast during Ramadan and say that you're going to study the Quran as your primary venture, your primary occupation during Ramadan. And fasting is going to assist your spiritual uh, quench. As you're reading, you don't have food and full bellies all interfering with your uh, ability to qualify spiritually for communication with Allah. You don't have a whole belly full of food interfering with that. But do you have a belly full of food interfering with it as Ramadan is currently practiced? Oh, absolutely. Yes, you do. Nam. Every night, most of us are eating like it's the Eid at Iftar. Full bellies. Can't even stay for the Tarawi or stand up straight for the Tarawi because we got the itis. You know what that is, some of you. You can get the itis. We stand there rocking and rolling. You know what I'm saying? Because your belly too full. You're not supposed to eat like that. Especially if you're fasting, you're hurting your body by eating like that during fasting. Any sane doctor will tell you that. You don't come off no fast by just gorging yourself with food and chug a lug and Kool-Aid and all that. First of all, everything on your plate is supposed to be fitra-based food. You should diminish the amounts of meats and heavy foods that you eat at night. And don't drink so much so that you'll be getting up two or three times during the night to go relieve yourself of the urine. <laughs> You're supposed to be saying the Quran and Ramadan is designed to push the reset button on your nature. When your infant gets too full, does it keep letting you put that nipple in its mouth or that bottle in its mouth? No, the baby knows innately close the lips to go all over his mouth before you let it put some more milk into his mouth. When it's finished, it's finished. That's it. That's your fits for nature. That's what you're supposed to go back to. When you press that reset button during Ramadan, you say enough is enough. You should stop every two and three chews and say, am I, am I, say she, you don't have to be full. Is this enough to hold me for the night? Is this enough to hold me? Do I have enough reserves from this meal? So that when I begin fasting in the morning, I won't have serious issues with hunger pangs and all of those things during the day. Allah says that we intended this to e be easy for you, not to cause you difficulty. You're causing difficulty for yourself when you do those things. So guidance and judgment between right and wrong, that's not what Furqan is. They translate it as discrimination, but what's doing the discriminating? Your frequencies. Whenever you allow a particular frequency to dominate in you, you do it to the exclusion of all other frequencies at that time. As I explained in my last class, just like your radio dial or like your television channels, you can't watch two and three channels through the same circumference of television tube or through the same uh, 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 frequency band on your radio. You can't listen to two or three radio stations at one time. You have to have two or three different radios to do that. Two or three televisions. 
So that's what the Quran is addressing. Frequency modulation. You have to discipline yourself enough to take control of your frequencies, lest someone outside of you, social conspirators, take control of those frequencies for you and over you. The Quran is designed to put those frequencies and their control back into your hands. Both of them, yet vain, both of your hands. So that you can become the master of your own appetites. So that's what Furqan is. And that's the purpose, the main purpose of Ramadan to modulate your frequencies. So start paying more attention to your frequencies than you're paying to the food on the table or to the idea of having sex with my mate after the sun goes down. Some people are thinking about that all day long. See? Well, I can't wait to get me a soda pop when the sun goes down. If you're drinking soda pop, you ain't really fasting anyway. How are you going to be trying to rid yourself of toxins and poisons? And then when it's time to eat, you start filling up your body with toxins and poisons. Let me say this about that. And we'll begin to wind down and conclude. So every one of you who is present, and then they put in brackets at his home. Why are they putting these brackets to make you think it's what they're talking about? This has nothing to do with you being physically home. <laughs> It just says every one of you who is present. Amazing. You know what being present of mind means, don't you? That's your hint. If you're not present of mind, meaning you're not in that headspace, this is not pertaining to you. The, 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 the fasting thing is not talking to you because you're not even in that mind space to be able to handle that level of discipline. So your focus should just remain on absorbing the guidance and the guidance is what's going to condition you to be able to discipline yourself in all of these other areas Allah says fasting was prescribed upon you as it was prescribed for those before you that you may learn self-restraint so fasting is not a new thing that's not what Allah is introducing to you in this ayat the fasting part of it what's new to you is the discipline related to the absorbing of Allah's hunan the guidance for purposes of resetting your frequencies so that you can be the master of modulating your own frequencies. When they have it on WBLS and you don't want that music interfering with your life, you switch the dial, you switch the band, see? And you take it down to the concerto, the Mozart. See, you, you put it over there where you can rest when you listen to that, but you can't rest when you're listening to Marvin Gaye talk about you know, sexual healing. See, that frequency is gonna jam you gonna jam you up <laughs> so you know listen to that especially during ramadan you know baby i need your love and got to get all your love you know sexual healing all this foolishness they put into so-called black music to cause us to become cuckoo like cocoa puffs just don't go raving mad people now and it's because of the frequencies that we've been inviting in we're not just letting them in anymore they broke the door down on us. And now we're just, well, any more negative frequencies out there? Any more frequencies to keep us in the lower chambers of our chakras where the materialism lives? Any more material, materialistic ideas, frequencies that we can, so we want more and more food. We want more and more sex. We want more and more uh, cars. We want more and more houses. We want more and more girls. We want more and more men. I'm not satisfied with one. I can't be satisfied with one man, girl. <laughs> Mute your phone, please. Okay. Can't be satisfied with one man. I hear women talking like this. He ain't got what it takes to satisfy me. I got to move around, roll around, you know, distribute my stuff, girl. Well, you were The last time I checked, that's what that was. So stop being a hole. And you got some holes amongst the Muslim girls and women. Y'all need to stop being holes and be what Allah created you to be. But you can't be that until you decide to slow down your role, concentrate on the guidance of Allah, the guidance of the Quran, the Hudan, see? And ask Allah to help bring you back to your central positioning, which is fitrah. 
and respect for that faith, Father, that Allah says that you should not alter. There are dire consequences to consciously attempting to damage the fitrah of Allah, to, to, to twist it and turn it and make it what you want it to be. There are dire consequences to that, dear people. And consequently, or I should say uh, reversely, if you try to discipline yourself according to the fitrah, you're going to get the barakat of Allah like you never dreamt would come your way. And that's whether you've taken shahada or not. It matters not who you are. If you read the Quran and you ask Allah for his guidance in whatever language you speak, and you concentrate on what it is you've asked Allah for, you make dua for it, Allah grants you that. He don't wait to see whether you're from Saudi or from Misr, from Egypt or from Lebanon before he grants you your prayer. That's prayer, dua. You don't want to look and see, well, where, Jibreel, uh, you want me to send a blessing where? To Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn? No, oh, we don't do Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn. I'm sorry. <laughs> Too many trashy people there. To, to, to West Side, Chicago? To West Side? We ain't sending no blessings over there, Jibreel. Are you kidding? You think Allah looks down and says, oh, well, let me, let me see what country is this before I send my blessings. Is it a Muslim country? You think Allah is, is Arab or speaks Arabic? Don't be foolish like that anymore. Talking to you Muslims out, out, out and about from here. Don't be foolish like that anymore. Don't let these wizards fool you through their language anymore. They have positioned themselves, as I said, to be in front of the true language and logic that was taught by Muhammad the prophet. And the only language and logic taught by Muhammad the prophet was the Quran itself. What else did he represent? He didn't represent himself. The Quran says about Muhammad that yeah, we found you strain. <laughs> we found you darling, darling, dalla. You, you were strain and we guided you. That's what Allah said. So Muhammad didn't invent the guidance. Allah sent him the guidance and it straightened him out. And now he sent Muhammad to straighten the rest of us out. So stop giving Muhammad the credit for guiding us. He's a, he's a, and he bad. He's a, he's an abda of Allah, just like all the rest of us. Who himself in his personal life and his actions made mistakes, according to the Quran, as a prophet, he made mistakes. Allah corrected him through the Quran. And Allah told, Allah told him about the, uh, the chastisement that would, that would visit him if he didn't do it the way Allah said do it. Allah said we would have severed his right arm if he had said something different than what we say and told him to say, meaning we, meaning Allah speaking through his creation, through everything that serves his will, Allah speaks through it. Said we would have severed his right arm if he had said anything. You know how nervous Muhammad must have been about every word that he spoke to these people? He said, man, I gotta make sure I get this the way it's coming to me. I gotta make sure I'm delivering this frequency purely as Allah gave it to me. So why do you say Allahu Akbar when that's not in the Quran either? You're changing the frequency band from where Allah had it set. Now you come in and you want to hear different music. So you start tweaking the band and moving incrementally the band until it's on your rock and roll and not on the Mozart where Allah had it set. The soothing compositions that caused you to think about the music of the spheres and what the universe is doing. You're moving from that now to thinking about what the whorehouse is doing or what the gambling spot is doing because you're allowing people to come in and change your frequency modulation, change that band. So you went from what the Quran says, which is Allahu al-Kabir, Allahu al-Kabir. That's one of Allah's attributes, that Allah is the greatest. El Kabir, that's in the Quran. You went from there to say Allahu Akbar, which means Allah is the greater. Now you might say, well, the greater sounds good, but the greater compared to what? Well, to other things that are great. The king is great. <laughs> the millionaire, billionaire, he's great. Elon Musk. <laughs> Donald Trump, you know, he's great. Joe Biden, these are great people. But Allah is greater. Now, that sounds good to your brain, but it's not logically correct according to the Quran. 
Why? Because Allah says, Lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakun lahu kufu wan ahad. Let me translate that correctly for you. He doesn't have babies. This is speaking about Allah and his uniqueness. That's how it starts out. So let's start there. Kul, say. Tell these people. That's what Allah is telling the Prophet. Whenever Allah says Qul, the Prophet has to announce it verbally. He can't just think it in his head like other parts of the Quran that Allah gives him, where he's just contemplating what Allah said. Whenever Allah says Qul, he's telling the Prophet, vocalize this. The letter Qaf represents what's in the subconscious, the back of the head. That's what the letter means, Qaf, the back of the head. The letter lamb means the tongue. So kul with its cough and lamb, Q-U-L, cough, lamb, means to take what's in your subconscious mind that you memorized, that I gave you, and speak it forth through the tongue. That's what kul means, nunetically. So Allah said, kul hu Allahu ahad. And it says to express that Allah they say is one, but that's not a correct translation. Because one suggests that there can be two. You see how they let this language creep into their translations? Yeah, Allah is one, but then Wadud is, uh, you know, El Wadud is two, and Allah is three. And, uh, you know, and they start naming all of these other gods in the Arab pagan pantheon of gods. I'm talking now about the people who heard Muhammad announce this and began immediately mistranslating his words, as Allah predicted they would do. They write the book with their own hands, and they say this is from Allah, to traffic with it for money. That's what Allah says. So when they said Allah is one, no. Ahad does not mean one, numerically speaking. Ahad means unique. To, to express, Allah is unique. See? Now we can go to those later parts of that three ayat surah that says, how is he unique? That's what the rest of the surah is about. How is he unique? Allahu samad. You've heard of the English word summit. Ain't nothing above it. That's what Allah is saying. He, he's, he's a, you can't even, listen, as far up as you go, Allah keeps going. He's above that. As far up as you go, get in the rocket ship, spaceship, whatever. Allah is still above that. In estimation. Then Allah says, Lam Yelid. He doesn't have babies. Walam Yulad. And he was never a baby himself. Walam Yakun Lahu Kufuan Ahad. And there is nothing to be compared with his Ahad with his uniqueness. So Allah says about himself that he is incomparable. What does incomparable mean? It means don't even attempt to put something next to me, even if you're saying that thing is not as good as I am or as great as I am. You can't even do that with me. You can't compare and say Allah is greater than the sun and the moon and the stars. And Allah is greater than Jesus. And Allah is greater than uh, Jehovah. You can't even do that. That's not Quranic language. That's pagan language. That's the language of the world that corrupted religious language and scripture. No, Allah says he is unique. And you can't compare anything to him. So if I say Allahu Akbar, Allah is greater, I have to have a greater than. What is Allah greater than? Everything. Well, you just compared Allah to everything. And you can't do that according to the Quran. Because Allah is Ahad. Singular and unique, if you want to put it that way. So Allahu Akbar. The language conspirator has told us that it was in the Quran. But that's not what the Quran says. It says, Wadhaqarullahi Akbar. And the remembrance of Allah, the dhikr of Allah, is greater. This is so beautiful. Once you understand what it is saying, Allah says that the dhikr, not that Allah is greater. 
He said, the dhikr that belongs to Allah is greater, is akbar. The remembrance of Allah, you can compare the remembrance of Allah with the remembrance of other things. That can be compared. That's a comparative. And akbar is as uh, superlative as you can get to describe a thing. But it's the superlative in the world of matter and creation. It's akbar only over created things, not over the creator, not the source creator. He's not comparing it to the source creator. His dhikr is a part of the reality of this material world and how you have to operate frequency-wise in this world. So he gives you dhikr, again, to discipline your frequencies by saying subhanallah, subhanallah, but understanding what that means for real. And just stop saying Allahu Akbar at the end of it. That was the trick that was introduced by the language schemers who wanted to bring Islam back to its pagan Arab beginnings. That was the plan afoot when they left Mecca and Medina and went into Persia for conquest and made that handshake agreement with the Zoroastrian rulers who on the most part were actually Jews. A lot of people don't know that. They were Jewish monks in that part of the world, Persia, ancient Persia, modern day Iran, it's called Iran back then also, right? They were Jewish monks who were ruling as religious scholars and leaders at that time. So they were the ones who gave the wink and the handshake to the pagan faking and frauding hypocrite Arab Muslims to say, yeah, we can, we can let you rule now. Just let us stay the leaders. And that was when they said, well, start writing it down like this since you are the ones who have paper on hand and now that you imported from those Chinese slaves you've been bringing in. They brought papyrus with them. See, there was no papyrus in Mecca and Medina. So they couldn't write anything down. They could scratch it on a stone, but they couldn't write it down. Once they got to Persia, they were able to write. And they said, well, let's write down the Quran, but we're going to give it the Persian translation of these words. Persian is a lot like Arabic, and they'll never know the difference. So we're going to write this thing. And in Arabic, just like the prophet had it or received it, but we're going to tell them that these words mean what the Persian version of these words mean, the Persian version. Where Mu'min means believer, you see, doesn't mean that in fitra based Arabia that the Quran was revealed in. Believer? Why would Allah make that the highest achievement for, for, for a Muslim? Believer. Most of us used to believe in Santa Claus. Belief in and of itself means nothing. You can believe in anything. I, you know, you believe that was your daddy until your mother told you you were 13. That ain't your real papa. Yeah, you're adopted, you know, whatever. You know, we believe a lot of things until something busts that bubble. <laughs> so belief, look at the word, belief. You know what a leaf is. You know what a leave is, believe. Start thinking about these words. A leaf is something that begins as an attachment to a tree, but with the strong wind, a strong enough wind, that wind can cause that leaf to become detached from the tree. And it'll just be floating independently in the air until it reaches the ground and becomes some animal's fodder. <laughs> it'll give its nutrients to the soil. It has no more movement and no more purpose. Once it reaches the ground, after it is left, as long as it's on the tree, it's being fed the nutrition from the tree. But when it becomes detached, see, that's what they mean by be a believer, be a leaf. Some of you will be attached properly. Others of you, if a strong enough emotional wind comes along, you're going to become detached from that. And you'll just be floating in the winds of circumstances until you die, until you drop. So that's no translation, but that's the translation that the Persians gave it. The language of Urdu, out of ancient Persia, the language of Farsi, out of ancient Persia, those are Indo-European languages, not Semitic languages. 
scriptures, as far as I've studied, all scriptures of the past were revealed in Semitic languages for a reason that I won't discuss tonight. Just understand that Hebrew, Arabic, Aramaic, all of these are Indo-European, uh, pardon me, all of these are Semitic languages revealed to people of various skin tones in the parts of the world that people speak the Semitic language, the so-called Semitic language. The umbrella of those languages is called Afro-Asiatic. That should tell you something. So it's dealing with the languages of Africa and Asia. So they had to come up with a category that would include European languages, and they called it Indo-European because they mixed what they found in India as a language with the languages of the Nordics from Northern Europe. They mixed those languages together, brilliant languages, but the schemes have become thoroughly entrenched in those languages, leading up to where we are now with this so-called Germanic language that we're speaking called English. So many bear traps in English. Starting with the fact that it's one of the only languages that has a capital and a small letter system. What's that all about? Ain't no capital letters in Arabic. There's no capital letters in English, in uh, Hebrew, pardon me. None in Aramaic, none in these other languages from the other part of the world. Why are they in our language? Because they're representing capitalized people and minuscule people in the world. You look at the capital English letter A, you see the pyramid at Giza. See, that's the pyramid. That's where the pharaohs lived and ruled. That's what they want you to know about them as capitalized people in the world. A lot to be said on that. Get my book called The N-Word to explain to you every English letter in detail and where it came from off of the walls of ancient Kemet or Egypt. The N-Word. There's new netics for the Arabic language system. There's the N-word, my second book, for the English letter system. And where every one of the 26 letters of the English alphabet came from, you better rush and get these books. I'm about to shut it down <laughs> and send everything to Amazon and beyond. All right. So you have to be present during that shahar. <laughs> and Allah says Faliyasumahu. Faliyasumahu. that's the word that they're translating as fast and that's not what that says fast is saum or siam the same root letters are being used but the way that the word is formatted gives it a different denotation I'll be breaking that down in detail. You already know the rest of that sentence. During the four weekends that I'm speaking for Masjid Allah in that weapon, those webinars. Now, so those who are present should spend it, they say, in fasting. Those who are present, shahida, that means those who are witnesses to the month. That's a strange expression. Witnessing the month. I can hear your brain cells churning from all of the way over here in North Kakalaki. I can hear you thinking from here. But if anyone is ill, and remember the word for ill, Maradon, the same exact three consonants that form the word Ramadan. See, Ramadan, Ra, Meme, Dod, Maradan, Meme, Ra, Dod. So the Meme comes first in Maradan, whereas the Ra comes first in Ramadan. What is Meme referring to? Your emotionality. What is Ra referring to? The light of your intellect. See, that's supposed to lead. That's supposed to be first. So Maradon takes the meme emotional nature and it substitutes it for the raw nature, the rising light nature in you. And what does it do to it? It causes it to become dawd or dead. You see the corresponding consonants now? Dawd means earth that is becoming deadened. 
depleted of its meme. See? So that's why it means illness or sickness. Allah says if you're in that situation or you're on a journey, suffering, that's where they get the word safari from, suffering. It's also where they get the word suffer because most people back then on a journey ran out of food, ran out of water, and they began to suffer. So if you're in that type of situation where you are not present, then Allah says that they prescribed a period. Then they put in brackets. It should be made up because it doesn't say that. Should be made up by days later. We'll break that down over the next four weekends. Now, here's the juicy part. Allah intends every facility for you. He does not want to put you to difficulties. He wants you to complete the prescribed period and to glorify him in that he has guided you and perchance you shall be grateful. So here's the tail end of the purpose for Ramadan. The purpose for Ramadan, Allah doesn't say he intends for you to fast and be miserable. Allah says he intends every ease for you. Whoa, how beautiful. He and then he could have left it like that, and we would have understood. Okay, Allah, you know, he 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 doesn't intend any difficulty. He he intends for us to have it easy, but he repeats it in a different phrasing. He does not want to put you to difficulties, because some people will say that Allah intends facility for you, but you got to go through this difficulty to get there. That's not what Allah said. And he knew the language schemers would come behind him and say that to you. Yes, brother, if you want the, the spiritual purity that comes along with being a Muslim, then you fast and uh, you stay away from the food and the drink and the sex for 30 days, 29 days, 30 days. It's going to be difficult for you, brother, because it's going to be hunger and thirst and you have to still go to work. And uh, sometimes the hours of the day are going to be like 12 hours, sometimes maybe 16 hours of daylight. Brother, are you ready to handle that as a Muslim? And that ain't what Allah said. Boy, oh boy, I can't wait to get into the meat of this subject dur during these weekends. Allah says he intends ease for you. So built into the Ramadan schematic should be ease. You should be looking for how this is easy for me. And if you're doing it correctly, do you know that the fasting part of what you're doing will be easier on you than when you are eating every day, two or three times a day? That becomes the hardship. <laughs> and if you try to jump right back to that after Ramadan, you do nothing but hurt yourself. Because the purpose is to reset the dial and then to keep the dial there, not to go straying back to the boogie woogie music after you've experienced the music of the spheres. You're supposed to keep your dial set on that discipline. That's the message, the purpose of Ramadan. I hope I've been clear enough on that this evening. So the entail of the purpose is here. He wants you to complete the prescribed period and to glorify him, to glorify him, wale to kabir, see, wale to kabiru, he wants you to glorify him, in that he has guided you, hadakum, hadakum, ma hadakum, he has, he has uh, 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 guided you, Focus on the guidance. For what purpose? So that you might say at the end of that journey to Allah, shukran. Now you think that means just say thank you, thankful and be grateful? No. This word grateful is speaking to an advancement in your frequencies. This whole surah is about how you can obtain Levels of excellence and purity within your frequency band, your brain waves, your heart's monitoring of frequencies and emotionalities and changes that you're going through, how you can bring all of that as a discipline under your control. And Allah says that perchance in following the guidance along the highways and byways that are going to lead you to this conclusion that I'm 
picturing for you and creating for you at the end of this journey, at the end of whatever you think is the end of the fast to prescribe period, he could have right there said 30 days. But at the end of it, perchance you shall be grateful. No, Tashkurun is from Shakara, Shukran. And we say that means thank you. I appreciate you. It's appreciation, but appreciation in the way that uh, money appreciates in the bank. Meaning that it accrues in value. So at the end of Ramadan, because you have taken the reins in your hands and have snatched the reins away from the social conspirators and the language conspirators, it's now back in your hands. You are controlling the beast beneath you, your material appetites, the god that was just dying in you, the materialism that you kept chasing until there was no more materialism to chase. You were just tired of new stuff, tired of a new car, tired of more money in the bank, and your life was at a standstill. Your life had become stagnant like that dried out skin that we saw in the picture above and the dried out earth that you saw that is typified in that letter, god, dead. Is dead skin, dead material ambitions because you become numb to it. You got so much that you don't know what to do anymore with it and you don't want to share it. That's part of your problem. That's why Allah said, slay the heifer. They had too much abundance under Moses. And Moses said, you got to get rid of some of this stuff. And they said, well, how are we going to get rid of all this stuff? What, what are we going to have to work with? And Moses said, get some garlic and some lentils. You know that story. <laughs> they said, really? We, we going to live off of garlic and lentils and cucumbers? Oh, such wisdom in that ayah. Maybe I'll pick that one out of the bunch and teach on that also before these weekends are up. Four things that he gave them to eat that are highly significant for the human, true human development. In any case, shukran is related to the Sanskrit word chakra that we've been dealing with now for months. Chakras, what are the chakras? They are seven basic levels of energy establishment that run up along the back of your spine and your spinal cord that regulate your frequencies that take your whole inner life from focusing on mundane material concerns at the bottom three chakras. But when that energy rises above the heart chakra and becomes activated by the heart's sensitivities and concerns, the rest of the journey, the next three chakras bring you into pineal gland enlightenment. And I don't mean that in any spooky guru, hippy dippy way. I mean that in terms of what the average one of us can come into once that achievement has been realized through your real eyes, that is. How to do that is going to be detailed for you in my second volume book, The True Meaning of the Salat, which will be available in the first couple of weeks of April Put your order in now. If you're a member of the University Online Learning Course and you have not paid uh, next month's uh, payment, if you uh, pay that payment, and you know what it is, pay that payment before the 28th of this month, March, you'll get that book for free. It'll just be a part of your Eid gift or whatever you want to call it. Okay? If you don't, purchase the book before the 28th, then you have to pay the $40 full price for the book. So that's the reward for people who do things early, if you can, no strain, all right? So again, the purpose of Ramadan is to put yourself back in touch with the guidance of the Quran as though you were never introduced to it in the first place. Begin like that. Begin from the first page. Don't necessarily try to cram one thirtieth of the book and fall asleep all in between your reading. And when you're finished reading, you don't remember anything that you read of importance. Don't do that. Go just a little bit at a time according to your frequency modulation. How much can your frequency? Allah says in the Quran to read as much of it as you can. Read as much of it as is comfortable. Why does that change during Ramadan? Who changed it? The star people who jumped in front of the moon. They're the ones who changed that. 
and to read it one thirtieth. They never wanted you to comprehend the Quran. The average person in education knows not to teach a child how to read by cramming a 30th of a whole book <laughs> into their minds per day with no test. Why are you doing that? Because the scholars said do it. Stop doing what the scholars say do every now and then, especially when they're wrong is two left feet. Don't do that. Read the Quran. Read as much of it as is comfortable for you. And if you study like I study, sometimes I can read one ayah and be the whole day studying just every word. Sometimes I study every sound of every letter. That's the level that I study on that I've been coaching you into doing yourselves. And some of you are starting to do that. Study the pneumatics method that way and pull the gems out of the Quran when you read. Be idhani by Allah's permission, not by mine. Only Allah can assist you in that. I can never give you the accurate understanding of the Quran. You can study based on somebody's methods of teaching you how to study, what to study, when to study, how to do this, how to meditate, how to concentrate. You can learn all of those formalities, but only Allah can bless you with the final outcome, which is receipt of the guidance. Only Allah can do that. None of us can do that. If we claim we can do it, we're nuts. And you should leave us quickly alone. So we glorify Allah because of the guidance. And hopefully we shall have graduated chakra energies when all is said and done. We should have graduated from the materialistic level up to the sensitivity levels of the heart and then beyond into what Imam Muhammad himself called the psychic, uh, the cosmic level of your human development. You should become cosmic man and woman after concentrating, contemplating huh, on that level every day, concentrating on singular objectives, especially related to Allah's influence on your very behavior, how you treat yourself, how you treat your family members, how do you treat your neighbors. Allah tells you what makes for a good Muslim and a good Mu'min in the Quran. He says, righteousness is not in turning your faces east nor west. What is Allah saying? What do they tell you to do when you line up for the salat? All right, everybody turn towards the Qibla. That's east, northeast in many cases. Allah said, that's not where Al-Bir is, the righteousness. That's not where righteousness, that's not right. That's not righteousness. Just saying, to, people were turning their faces toward the Qibla. In Jerusalem, before Muhammad came, until the order was given to turn in this different direction. But that has nothing to do with the direction of the Kaaba in Mecca. Another surprise that you're going to learn about during this Ramadan, inshallah. You should be asking Allah in a dua to preserve the life of instructed Benjamin Bilal so he'll be here to teach you about it. <laughs> Yeah, it should be, that should be a dua for, for Instructor Bilal's health, his mental health, his physical health, his spiritual health, his emotional health. Because I pray for all of you just that way. Keep them here, oh Allah, until they can see their glory days. Yes, sir, brother. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That should be a dua. When you make your dua for your family and your friends and your, you know, your job or whatever you're making it for, you should slip in Instructor Ben. If that's all you call me, Instructor Ben, Instructor Bilal, may Allah preserve his life. And if he's incorrect, may Allah preserve him long enough to make the necessary corrections because nobody's 100% right. Nobody. All right. So that's the purpose, you good people, to have an advancement in your chakric evolutionary energies so that your pineal might become ignited. Now, what's the importance of that? That's given in the very next ayah. I hope I included it here. I did. 186, where Allah says something that sounds as though it's completely different than the subject he was just addressing, called Ramadan, and they say fasting. See if you see Ramadan or fasting in this very next ayah. Where Allah says, when my servants ask you concerning me, I am indeed close. I listen to the prayer of every suppliant when he calls on me. Let them also, with a will, listen to my call and believe in me that they may walk in the right way. 
No mentioning of Ramadan. No mentioning of fasting. Seemingly out of place. And many of the so-called non-Muslim scholars who are critics of the Quran, they say, see, this shows that Muhammad was just repeating stuff that he learned from other Arabs or from the Jews or from, because this, this doesn't even have any place. And then in the very next ayah, he goes right back to talking about fasting. Why is this sandwiched in the middle of two verses that are talking about fasting to throw you bad people off the trail? That's why Allah put it there. So that you would say exactly what you ended up saying. This can't be guidance. This can't be from the creator of all who knows everything. Why would he interrupt this important topic of Ramadan and fasting to introduce something, something dealing with calling on him and him responding to you? Allah doesn't respond to these knuckle-headed humans. Is, is Muhammad kidding? No, he's not kidding. These are words from the source creator of the skies and the earth and everything in between. Listen to this carefully. Because if you have done what you are supposed to do during Ramadan in studying, paying meticulous attention to Al-Hudan, not Al-Hudan, but Hudan, the guidance, a guidance, actually. If you did what Allah was asking you to do. And in the process, you were able to get control of Al-Furqan, the regulation of those frequencies within you. And you were able to, with the help of Allah, shift those radio bands in you or those television channels in you from the porno channel to the nature channel. You get it? See, that's all in us. The channel that wants to see Big Booty every now and then in, in a video to the channel that wants to see big booty in terms of big wealth come to your community, that booty. So you have to choose which booty you're going to concentrate on during Ramadan. See, you want wealth building to establish community life as the Quran also calls for in many different places? Or do you just want to be mundane, stuck in the sexual healing stages of your development in the lower chakras around the, 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 the uh, sex organs. You want to stay there? Well, that's your choice. But you won't be of those who have graduated chakras. Those energies would not have been developed and evolved in you. Now, for those who allow those energies to come all of the way back up, past the heart, past the communication valve called the throat, up into the so-called third eye, third eye where the pineal gland sits as a base and then the energies that come out of the pineal express themselves in the seventh heaven of your own body where they place the halo. That's where those energies are concentrating. When you do the proper things to ignite the fire, so to speak, of the pineal, you won't go into uh, zombie land doing that if you just do it naturally and stop depending on all of this tantric breathing and all of this other stuff and the gurus and the yoga positionings. You don't have to go through all of that to do what I'm talking about. All you have to do is do your best to follow very closely what Allah is saying in the guidance called Quran. When Allah says do something, you should try your best to do it in that moment if you can. If Allah says that righteousness is feeding the poor, then you should have it on your schedule when you leave in the morning for work or for whatever actions you have to complete, that I'm going to take an extra couple of sandwiches out there to the park or to the highway and the byway where I know some homeless person is standing there begging for money and food. So whatever Allah said, I'm going to follow the guidance closely and do not think about it, not theorize about it. I'm going to do what Allah said do about my family members. Allah says family ties have a first right in the book of Allah. So who haven't I spoken to in my family since last Ramadan maybe, or me before that, I, or because of the COVID, I stopped talking to my, that was a good excuse for me to stop talking to my uncle Willie. Yeah, that's a great excuse. I can't come see you Willie, I can't talk to you either on the phone, I might catch something, I'm talking to you on the phone Willie, I gotta go. <laughs> see? <laughs> Don't do that. Say, I haven't spoken. Let me think about the relative who I least like communicating with. And sometimes for good reason. But I'm going to just going to, I'm going to try and at least give him a call. I'll write him a letter. I'll text him at least. Cousin Willie, I was thinking about you. Uncle Willie, Uncle Bilbo, Bobbo, Bebo, whoever. I was thinking about you. 
I pray that everything is right on your side of the fence. Sorry I haven't been able to come see you. But uh, hopefully we'll get together before the next family reunion or at the next family reunion. You should try, and believe me, Allah will bless those efforts. You'd be surprised the miracles that will happen when you follow that particular approach. Make up with your spouse. OJ said 992 arguments. 992, I'm sick of you. Oh, what a heck of a song to sing and have your wife hear that or your husband hear that. We do nothing but argument, argument, argue, you know? Maybe we just weren't meant for each other. Yeah, this might have been a big mistake for two people to understand each other. How long does it take? <laughs> That's what the song said. <laughs> Those frequencies, keeping you in the lower chambers is all I'm saying. Frequencies that are speaking about respect and love for each other. Those are the ones you want to concentrate on. But try not to do the music at all if you can during Ramadan. While you're concentrating, meditating, and contemplating. Try to leave music, even the music you consider to be positive music. Even jazz and all of that that has no words. All of them are frequencies that are competing with the Quran's frequencies. If you want the real music, listen to the Quranic recitation in Arabia. Just, even if you don't know what it's saying, just listen to it. It has a message for you also that your subconscious mind is absorbing. And then when you get to reading the English or the Spanish or the French or whatever you read in, then you start contemplating on the words that you know in your language. They're going to have valuable impact upon your intellect if you try to figure out the words, even the mistranslations of words the incorrect meanings, but you cannot completely blot out, blank out, cut out, stop the flow of the truth that the Quran is presenting, no matter what language they translate it into. It's impossible to totally obliterate the frequencies, even in other languages. So don't worry about reading it in English if English is all you read, but at least learn the Arabic alphabet so you can begin identifying the meanings for Arabic and letters as seed letters whose meanings factor into the meaning of the overall word in Arabia. That's all I ask you to do. Just learn the letter system and what each letter means. All of that is found in the book, Nunetics, the nature-based meanings of Arabic letters. So when it reaches that pineal gland, after the chakras have become evolved and developed, then Allah says, when my ibadi, when my servants, when they inquire, Salaka, when they ask you questions concerning me, Ani fa'inni karibun ujibu da'wat al da'i. This is so beautiful. He turns to you, the developed one, the one with the developed bandwidth that you've been working on through concentration, meditation, and contemplation, alone and in groups. I'm creeping up on the meaning, the true meaning of salat. There are several levels for understanding salat, and that's why several versions of that uh, root word is given in the Quran. There's several versions of it, and they mean different things. And one is mentioned most of the time along with as zakat. Wa ita'i, uh, pardon me, wa ikaumu salat, wa ita'i zakat. Most of the time they're mentioned as kissing cousins or twin siblings. As salat, whatever that means, and as zakat, and whatever that means. And you say zakat means to give charity. Okay, if you believe that, let's say it does. That means that most of the time you do what you believe to be as salat, you're supposed to follow it immediately with as zakat. Immediately. Well, I do that, man, at the Juma. That's what I do before I leave the masjid. Brother, I give my zakat. I ain't talking about that. I said immediately after you perform what you say is the ritual prayer. How many times do you pray again a day, brother? 
Where did you make uh, your fajr? Where did you make salat al-fajr? At home? Really? Okay, that means you were supposed to find somebody to give to right after you made that salat, according to the Quran and how it uses the word. Somebody with, with you there in your house? You're supposed to think ahead of time or after the prayer. I need to do something good for my wife. That's something that will benefit her. Something that will help purify her and my relationship because zakat also means to purify. It has to do with the purification. Hmm. So what can I do as an action for my wife or for my sleeping young children who have to get up and go to school? Is there something I can do to make their day more pleasant or to purify the relationship that I have with them so that when they come home from school and I come home from work, they want to just run and jump in my arms, you know, seven years old, 12 years old, hug up kids. Is there something I can do to help purify our connection? Because so that also means to connect. Okay, you're supposed to be thinking about that as you're getting up, making what you call wudu. Another word that's not in the Quran, but we'll, we'll let you get away with that for now. There's no wudu in the Quran. What you call wudu is what the Quran calls guzul. And what you call guzul, full bath, is what the Quran calls tahara. Who's making this stuff up? What you call breaking your fast, dear people, at sunset, Maghrib, is what the Quran calls breaking your fast when the Layl appears. Layl is night, not sunset. You're supposed to be fasting as I am from sun up, not to sundown, but to sunset when the sun has actually gotten out of the picture and the onset of true night and layl you know what layl means when that appears that's in this keep reading when you go read these these verses i'm giving you just keep reading you'll see it in another two or three verses it'll tell you exactly what the time frame for fasting is how in the world did millions, now over 2 billion Muslims, miss this in the Quran when it's plain as day in the language that they speak Arabic? I'm going to tell you how they missed it. Because somebody in history took that star and placed it in front of that crescent moon. That's how they missed it. They let the crescent moon wane until there was no more moonlight. And they let the star of uh, fabricated sunnah and fabricated hadith be the ruler in the world of their logic. That's how they missed it. So they're reading the Quran through the hadiths and the hadiths say maghrib. They're reading the Quran through the eyes of hadith and the hadiths say sunnah of Muhammad, not the Quran. Quran speaks about his uswa, but it never says anything about Muhammad's sunnah. It talks about Allah's sunnah. How come you don't know Allah has a sunnah and you're in Juma every week? with qualified imams who speak the language of Arabia, Falukatul Arabia. But none of them have ever bothered to mention during the important, the most important day of the week, Juma, that let's make this correction on the language, brother. Allah speaks of his sunnah, sunnah to Allah, but never in the Quran does Allah speak about sunnah of Muhammad. That's only in the hadith. But Allah does speak about the uswa of Muhammad and Abraham. So let's talk about what that uswa is. How many before Imam Muhammad or even after Imam Muhammad, outside of his association who heard him say that and who do teach on that, how many Muslims from the broader Muslim world even know what we're talking about right now? And it's in the Quran. They speak a lot about what is not in the Quran to justify the Hadith in the same way that the Jewish leaders and rabbis spoke morally, uh, morally more about the Talmud, the teachings of the rabbis, then they speak about the actual Torah. They, they put the Torah aside like Muslims put the Quran aside. They have it in their homes just as a scroll or something up on a high shelf like Muslims have the Quran up in the high shelf of their homes. But their references are not immediately the Quran. The references for most Muslims I talk to around the world, their first references are from the Hadith, not the Quran. That's how they missed it. That's how the Star and Crescent became the international symbol of Muslims all around this planet. 
even though it's not in the Quran, no star and moon in the Quran, no crescent and moon in the Quran, no crescent and moon on a flag of Muhammad or nothing. He didn't mention it, not even in the Hadith that they try to get away with saying he, he knew about the star and crescent because they know they got that from witchcraft. Look at the wizard's cap, star and crescent. That's where they got it from. And it transferred over into Muslims once uh, the wizards of language saw that Muslims wanted a symbol to compare and to contrast with the Christian symbol of the dead man on the cross. That's where that came from. They got the symbol of death. We got the symbol of life, the beginning crescent of the moon, the beginning of new light. That's the way they had it initially. Some crazy devilish minded somebody came along and said, let's flip the script, take it from the new moon and make it the final phase of the moon. Because we have a plan to totally phase out Al-Islam and replace it with Islam. We're going to take out the definite article, Dean. Al-Islam, Deen Al-Islam, and we're going to replace it with just Islam, you know, anybody's submission, submission the way we say you should submit with all these rituals and all of these zikrs and a thousand zikrs will put you into paradise and all these lies. We're going to pad it with lies and say, this is your religion. I'm just about to. So when you follow the discipline outlined in my earlier statements, you're going to feel the difference inside of you. You're going to feel the difference. You're going to feel your growth and development taking place on an evolutionary scale unimagined by you prior to this. But you have to learn how to concentrate, contemplate, and meditate. I'm going to be giving classes in this on some of the evenings during this month, actual 30 minute classes where you would just do what I do or not do what I do, just watch what I do or write down what I do and then try it for yourself and see if it works for you. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't because there's no one way to complete what's being called the Salat in the Quran. Allah says, standing, sitting, lying on your sides. That's a way of saying this, that, or the third. Take your choice. Pick your choice. Because the objective is to get the job done, not the formation and the formal standing and the ritual and the robotic moves and all of that. And you don't even know what you're saying in Arabic. Risal al Fatiha, the average one in the Muslim population, and I'm including the international immigrant Muslim population because I've asked them. Can you recite El Fatiha to me, but in English? They couldn't do it. They made all kinds of mistakes because this is not their language, of course. But what I'm saying to Muslims in America is that if you began trying to translate for yourself, beginning with El Baqarah, you can't get past Alif Lam Mim because you don't know what that means. And you let the people of the stars, <laughs> the stars in front of the crescent people, you let them tell you that Alif Lam Mim has no meaning. Only Allah knows and his messenger. His messenger ain't here, so only Allah knows. And the only way we're going to know is when we die and meet our maker. What kind of stuff is that for them to say about Allah who told you that the entire Quran is fully detailed and that it's a clear book? So if it's clear, how come we can't understand Alif Lam When even in their Bukhari Muslim hadith, they have the prophet as saying that Every letter has its own unique meaning. He said, I don't mean Alif Lam Mim as the opening up of, say, Al Baqarah. He said, I mean Alif has its own meaning. Lam has its own meaning. Mim has its own This is a bona fide Bukhari Muslim hadith teaching you this. Go look it up. You search for it. I'm not going to do your homework for you, but it's there. So he told you let letters all have unique meanings. So why do you scoff at me for saying the same? When I'm bringing you the true deen and the essence of that deen as the Quran teaches it and also as some of the salvageable hadith teach it to you. Well, Instructor Bilal, you're in no position to tell us what's salvageable amongst the hadith. You're not a qualified alim. 
to be telling us what's a no. Well, you don't think so. Okay. So I'll point you to the ones who you think are qualified. How about the scholarship over in uh, Saudi? Do you think they're qualified? Oh, of course. They're the ones who Allah has entrusted to be the keepers of the Kaaba, the holy city of Mecca. Those people, those scholars, yeah, I trust those people. Okay. Let me tell you what they said. They said that they have, and this was a few years ago that they started this. I don't know where they are in the project, but they said, we're going to reinvestigate every single one of the 7,000 some odd hadiths that we have been accepting as acceptable. They said, because in our initial search through these hadiths, we have found out that 95% of the ones that we have combed through that we were believing were legitimate, he said, had serious errors and mistakes in them. So now we have to go through the whole thing when we're finished, only the ones that we truly deem to be acceptable will be presented to the Muslim public. So you don't even know that they're doing that. Nobody put out a fatwa about that. Nobody said, here's what we're going to embark on because it's embarrassing to Muslim ulima and folks to tell you that. That's embarrassing to tell you what we've been forcing you and the children to accept and your women to accept about what this hadith says versus what the other one says versus what the Quran says that the hadith doesn't say and what the hadith says that the Quran doesn't say. But we still want you to follow it, although the Quran doesn't say it. We're embarrassed to tell you that we were wrong. But that's exactly, they have it in their Saudi newspaper articles. I'll dig mine up and provide it for you if necessary. So where are you on the scale of things? You have to understand my final point that Allah is shifting paradigms as we speak in this world. Even COVID was a part of that shifting of paradigms on the part of Allah. You say, well, how can that be? And you've been speaking about COVID as a scheme of the social manipulators. Yeah, I told you that the word COVID-19, that that was a code phrase, C-O-D-E phrase, that stood for Certificate C of Vaccination, O-V, I-D, Identification, Certificate of Vaccination, Identification. This is the ultimate objective of this whole plan that they put forth about two and a half years ago to make sure that every human being on earth gets the vaccine. They planned that back in 2015. You can find Mr. Bill Gates right now on YouTube, on TED Talks, just Google it, 2015, talking about how there's going to be this huge disease coming our way called coronavirus. I thought it started in 2019, 2020. They, he was saying this in 2015. How did he know that? What gave him the authority to announce that to the world? This man is not a doctor. He's not a medical person. He's not a scientist. He's a computer maker. He can't get the viruses out of his computer. How are you going to get it out of your body? And now he's on television saying that he was wrong, that we overplayed the whole coronavirus thing and that it wasn't the emergency they said it was. And well, you know why? Because he took the money and ran already. He already got the billions of dollars from having a patent on the coronavirus. Can you imagine that? He has a patent. Him and Fauci have patents on the coronavirus and aspects of it. You can't get a patent on something that nature produces. Listen to me carefully. You cannot patent nature. You think you can patent that tree outside your window? You can't do it because God created it according to them. You can only patent what man has influenced. If Even if nature is a part of it, man has to have the predominant influence in it for you to ask for a patent and receive it. Listen carefully. So that means if they have a patent on the coronavirus, and there are several of them, I'll send it to you. Then the coronavirus cannot be attributed to nature. Coronavirus cannot be blamed on Allah. 
he, 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 he hates humanity now. He's trying to get rid of us. He's doing like the God of the Old Testament did and trying to get rid of the people of Noah's time. The Bible says that God lamented that he ever created man on earth. And now he's going to drown them out with a flood all over the world and start over again. That's the Bible. The Quran never says anything like that. The so-called flood of Noah in the Quran is local and regional. <laughs> You know, if, a, if a, fl a flood came through Louisiana and only affected certain cities in that state, and it was up above the horse's bridle, people were on the bridges trying to get away from the amount of water. So a flood that floods out a whole community of people doesn't have to be worldwide. It can just be in your region. And that's all the Quran is talking about, amongst other things that are more esoteric than that. When you understand what a flood does to the water and when you understand what water symbolizes in the human makeup, you'll understand that you're being flooded out as we speak. And this flood is worldwide because the scheme reached worldwide proportions in 2019, 2020 with the certificate of vaccination identification 19. The number one is the letter A. The number nine is the letter I in the English alphabet. So it's the Certificate of Vaccination Identification, AI, which as you know, stands for artificial intelligence, which was the scheme from the very beginning to replace you, you dumb, stupid, true human, flesh and blood, makes mistakes person with this perfect, replica of you that we have created in the laboratory called artificial intelligence. This is the life that we want to rule the world, but it has to first take over your life. So we're going to get you and your children's soul used to messing with gadgets that when we unpack this real agenda of ours to replace your butts with this artificial robot version of you, you won't even, you won't even holler because you'll say, oh, this is what we've been prepared for. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, oh, we can look through this and we can see movies and it's like we're right in real time. Look through these goggles. Yeah, look through them. It's real simulation, like reality. Oh, so they're getting you so used to simulation that when they unpack this thing, like an iRobot, Will Smith, iRobot, and they start unpacking it and you see that they're really here to take your place on the job as the bus driver, as the garbage collector, and you have nothing to do anymore except be wasted, what Imam Muhammad called the great elimination of the soul. Do you understand what this man was talking about? You have no soul. What, what good is the rest of you? Especially when they have found a way to replicate your body in a way that they can pull the plug on when they want to, or they can keep it living for as long as they want to. Now, their slaves have unlimited life. And therefore, we don't want all of these robots and people on earth at the same time. We got to eliminate one or the other. Let's tweak this AI thing and then eliminate this human basharun mythlikun thing. That's the plan. I don't know what else to tell you. Now that might sound like bad news to you, but it sounds like good news in the ears of people whose frequencies are tuned to Allah's call. Because when I speak to Allah, he says, he listens to the prayer of the caller when he calls on him. He just wants us with a will to listen to his call. It's a cosmic call. It's a call to the best that's in your nature. It's a call to return to the excellence that Allah created in your cellular structure. Do you understand? Allah created an excellence within your genes that he wants you to start respecting and responding to and stop respond responding to the artificial callers out there that are calling you to wickedness and perversity and uh, single gender foolishness, males with males, females with females. And that's not the end of that journey. Very soon, you'll be hearing that there's a major effort to pit, not pit, but to put adults with very young children as lovers, as sex mates. Yeah, 30-year-olds, 60-year-olds having sex and getting married to six-year-olds. They primed the Western world for that 
through the MAMBLA organization, the Man, Boy, and Love Association, whatever the acronym stands for. They've been priming us for many decades now by making that acceptable within a small cadre of, of world citizens where it's okay for you to have love affairs with minors, 12 years old, 10 years old, and so forth. They have primed people in the world for that as test pilots for the bigger agenda where these freaky deaky people who are ruling the world, they are so over satiated with their own madness. They have so many instances of sexual exploitation and warfare exploitation that they can't get enough of bloodshed now and they can't get enough of the lower drives and those influences upon them. They can't have enough. They got to have sex with robots now. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? I'm 1,000% I'm serious. They're not satisfied to have sex with real women, these men, these perverts. They have to have sex now with dolls and now robots that feel like real women in the skin that have temperature. When you touch them, they're warm. When you speak to them, they smile. When you tell a joke, they laugh. That's the level of AI that they are right now perfecting to replace the true human. And these creatures have no souls. Imam Muhammad said, we're coming into the point where you're going to experience the elimination of the human soul. And he said, and it will be soon. Now, he said that before he passed in 2008. This is soon after that. So you can sit around here and, you know, mumble and fumble and jumble your way through life, thinking that it's going to be okay. It's just a period. And it's just something we got to get over. Inflation in the nation, heading for starvation. You remember all the little songs of the 50s and 60s and 70s? ball of confusion is just a just a temporary thing what they have created is no temporary thing but the reason why i said you shouldn't be sad you should actually be glad is because of something i heard imam muhammad say he said you are living in a day and time when people are about to sit down at the table of the fifth dimension. He said, and it is a round table. And then behind that, in the same lecture, he said, I know what they say about the new world order. He said, but what I'm here to tell you is that Allah, see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to bring about his new world order, Allah's new world order, through their Mouth through there. How did he put that? I don't know if he said through their mouths or through their actions, but it meant the same thing. He's going as they are talking about the new world order and the Ilama, the Illuminati. Allah is building His new world order and His people of enlightenment. You get it simultaneously. So when they're finally ready to pull the stage curtains back and say, "Here we are. We're taking over now," and all the rest of you have to be eliminated, Allah is going to have a plan waiting for them that says, "No, the great elimination is going to happen on you and yours." That's where the curse is going to fall. And when you begin to fall like dominoes, then the true humans would have qualified themselves by then to step in and take the lead over this world. But it won't happen until the true humans with true human intent, decide that we can't take this anymore. We shouldn't stand for this anymore. And we're going to qualify ourselves to be the de facto leaders in this world. That's what Nunetics is here to do in language. Because everything begins with language. Allah said to Adam, tell them their names. That's language. That's where you have to begin. You can't begin in politics. You can't begin in economics. All of those things are encompassed within the field of understanding terminology communication. That's why Musa had to have the knot untied from his tongue, so to speak. If he couldn't communicate, the people would accuse him of not delivering the message clearly. So have faith. But understand that all of your blessings and your chances for paradise lie in your ability to do good actions behind the profession of faith. Profess faith, those who have faith, 
and do good deeds, conscious deeds of reconciliation. Yeah. That's that's the way we have to be. Someone wanted to say something? Okay. Yeah, all right. Okay. So I'm going to remove my notes. I'm not going to uh, entertain any questions. That's not what tonight was for, but just to present you with the full picture as much as I humanly could of what's happening in the world, what you have entered into as frequency modulation during this period called the Ramadan, sun, moon, and dead and earth that we're attempting to revive by giving fresh water to. Come into Ramadan with fresh emotionality, with fresh moral integrity. Doesn't matter what you did wrong yesterday or last month. Come into Ramadan with the promise to Allah in dua. Oh, Allah, make me a better person morally. Make me a better person spiritually. Make me a better family man, a better husband, a better wife, a better child to my parents, a better neighbor to the people I haven't spoken to since before COVID because I was scared to touch them. Let me go back and knock on their door and say, I'm sorry. Is there anything I can do for you now? I know you're 86 years old, ma'am, and I know you live alone. I should have been visiting you every day during this so-called pandemic to at least see how you were doing. I'm sorry for neglecting you. That's what Ramadan is for, to reconnect with the moisture because of that hot burning sun, right? The burning heat of Ramadan. I need you to reconnect with your human nature is what Allah is saying. And the best way to do that is to read and accept the guidance that I have provided into the world. Read it, accept it, reassess it, and apply it. I mean, thank you. That's the message. So, with that said, we're going to conclude. I thank all of you for your participation. I see quite a few names here who are new. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Alhamdulillah. Now, uh, when you touch it. <laughs> Bahina. Bahina never ceases to, to surprise me with her comments. One of the best commentaries we get in the videos on YouTube are from Bahina. Let me just see if there's anything that I need to uh, respond to before we close out. Okay. Instructed Bilal, should the word khara or El Kharun be the goal of Ramadan, meaning to be in good circumstances or excellent, wealth, pious, best, better, good. And yeah, cargo, good, goods, good. Yeah, that's a good connection. But the word khair means to be of benefit. It doesn't mean morally good. It means to be useful, to be beneficial. So for sure, that's a part of the doing of good that all of us are instructed to do through the Quran. So that's one of the goals, absolutely. One of the purposes is to establish what is khayr. Allah says that he is khayr and he accepts only that which is khayr. And understand also that those consonants that are in the word khayr are also in the word ahira. Mm. Mm-hmm. I <laughs> <laughs> see you, Jerry. Uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. oh, stick with this instructor, boy. I'll tell you, I can do this all night long. I think some of y'all believe that. Some mm-hmm. of you have have done it. I've been up till three or four in the morning, just I, well, I got, point. I, I got the word from uh, Layla to Carter, Aya uh, number three. Yeah, that's right. Oh, we're going to be going through that before <laughs> the end of the That's right. <laughs> you see what it says? Alafi Shahr. That's where your Shahru is. Go to yes. the, what is that? Surah 86, I think. El Qadr. 97. 97. Okay. Go to the Surah that's speaking on the night of power before I get there in a couple of weeks <laughs> and see what Allah how, how Allah uses the word khair there. They say a thousand months. Yes, yes. But that's not what it means. Shahr, as I said, is connected to leadership, especially corrupt leadership. 
Hmm. That's why they um, use the word in the old I, world. I, I think, Hold on, let me. I don't want commentary right now. That's why they use that okay. word in the old world of scholarship for leader. Shah. They use that word shah. Wow. The, the R just electrifies it and makes it move as energy. That hmm. leadership. Hmm. So shahar. And you know, the SH sound on words means to leave a central place and spread out all around, like the shore, the seashore, or the sun called shams. It distributes its light. So shah represents those leaders who establish their leadership as the bright light or the thing to reach all of the places within view. You you follow what I'm saying? I, I, what I was going to say, the, the higher upper upper class uh, of Arabic, Arabian officials, they use a different kind of Arabic than a regular, I think it's called Fusa. Fusa? Forget everything you've been told. Oh. <laughs> okay. You're not, you're not prepared to teach on it, don't speak on it. Because uh, you right. can send me into a whole other direction and I'm trying to close out here. All, all right. right. <laughs> okay. You're good with the, you're good with the pen. I'm done. Text it to me, type okay. it to me, email it to me, but I don't want to stop and go into a whole nother direction. I'm, okay. All right, I'm good. I'm good. Most people here don't know yeah. anything about Fusa. I know Imam Muhammad mentioned Fusa as being the Arabic, but that's not how the Quran uses Fusa. Or well, you should ask yourself the question, is the word Fusa in the Quran? That's That should be your question. So no, you, no, no. I, I, was, I was just thinking about the Arabic, how, how they hide things. No, I understand uh, what not, you're saying, the, but if I say yeah. yes, if I just give you a blanket answer and say yes, people would know what I was talking about. Oh, uh, yes, you're right. Fusa was the higher form of Arabic spoken in Arabia. They can't identify with. They don't know what you're talking. They don't know what I'm talking about when I say most of the stuff mm. I say. They have to research it like you do. All right, so we're not going to go there. Let me close out officially. Mm. All right, I want to do what you're doing. I want to lay on my pillow. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'll go talk to my wife before she goes to sleep. If she ain't <laughs> ready. <laughs> I mean, something. Let me get off this computer. <laughs> all right. In any case, all good actions are what you should be doing during Ramadan, but the best of actions during this particular period of frequency recalibration, the best action is to put yourself directly in contact with Allah's guidance. Y'all got that? Yes. So, yes. So, yes. Quick question. Quick question about me before you get off. You said you're gonna have the uh, 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 webinars of what over the, over the weekend starting tomorrow. What time? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's going to be my time, Eastern Standard Time, from eleven to twelve thirty. And this Saturday and Sunday. Yes, sir. Both days for four weekends in a row. I don't have that information in front of me because it's a different Zoom, and I will email you guys the contact, the link for those uh, sessions. I think it's the same link. So once you get the first one, you're good to go for the rest of the sessions. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So I'll try and do that before I go to bed tonight. <clears throat> I'm going to have to do it tonight because... Tomorrow. Tomorrow yeah, <laughs> exactly. All right. More the reason for me saying Betty bye or going Betty bye and saying goodbye to all of you. So thank you for your time, your patience and your participation as I greet you in the greetings of peace that obligate each of us to keep that peace. Salamu alaikum to you all. Wa alaikum salam. And thank you again for being present. Wa alaikum salam. Wa alaikum salam.